for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Welcome, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Oh, man. Fade to Black, the spoke radio for the masses. Tonight's Wednesday, October 6, 2021. 278 days into the new year, only 87 days left. How you doing? All right, we are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of nowhere, a total undisclosed location, but it is beautiful. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? Tonight is our 1500th show. 1500, our guest tonight grant cameron grant's going to be with us at the bottom of the hour tomorrow night is another fader night with open lines all night long the call-in number of course is 747-228-2051 we'll see you tomorrow night for fader night i will be at the starworks usa ufos all the above and beyond conference this november 12th through the 14th in laughlin nevada at the aquarius hotel and casino with Jacques Vallée, Paul Heine, Grant Cameron, Colin Andrews, Jaime Musan, 10 other amazing speakers. Tickets and info right now over at StarWorksUSA.com. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. The links for StarWorks are below if you're over on YouTube. You can just click on it, head straight over. Um, I got lots of email. Uh, you can text uh, text Stacy uh, or tweet Stacy and tweet like that Stacy with an I. And uh, I, I don't know about promo codes. Um, everybody's asking if I have a promo code. Ask Stacy if I have a promo code. Stacy, do I have a promo code? Stacy. Hey, Ken, thank you for that. The $1,500 club. $1,500 tonight. Yeah, just uh, just tweet Stacy and, and get over there and get that done. All right, Stacy, if I have a promo code, pop it up there. Uh, that would be great. And uh, there you go. Yes, tonight is show number 1500. I was a little scattered before the show. Um, I'm going to talk about some stuff uh, that is developing. Uh, well, it's already developed. It's already done um, in, in just a little bit. But right up to showtime tonight. Man, I'm on the phones. I'm getting stuff done. I'm just doing things. And, and the next thing you know, I went over to the coffee machine and I, I went to, you know, I, I, coffee's in it, hit the power button, right? And I'm just on the phone. I'm just doing this, doing that. Blah, 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 blah. I, I ran um, uh, between, I'm going to say between 6 o'clock and 5 till 7, uh, 10 phone calls. Back to back, just boom, 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 boom. And I go up to the car, and there's no, I'm like, oh, I forgot to put water in it. So now I'm putting water, you know, now it's 10 minutes to show time and I'm, I'm adding water to the coffee machine. Uh, normally everything is just smooth. 
you know, just smooth. I'm doing my last little news updates at six o'clock and I'm just kind of cruising through and, you know, and sound check at six 30. I do that every night, like clockwork and then go in and, and start the coffee, take a deep breath and, you know, get all psyched up for the show and whoop, no coffee <laughs> before showtime. So that was it, man. I came running in here. Uh, hit play to start the show 30 seconds late. Anyway, it's our 1500th show. That's what happened. Oh man. I had just high hopes for tonight. <laughs> All right, let's get to the breaking news. A newly developed bipedal robot can seamlessly switch between walking and flying. You've got to see it. It's called Leonardo. Some call it Leo for short. The name is an acronym for Legs On Board Drone. This thing is Terminator. It wa it's a ro it's a walking robot that flies. <sighs> the Caltech engineers who built Leo didn't just slap a pair of robotic legs onto an aerial drone. No, not at Caltech. Not at Caltech. Bob Lazar was not involved with this, too, by the way. They had to design the bot with both walking and flying in mind and develop specialized software that integrates uh, various components. And it is the creepiest thing you have ever seen. Nice hair. I have good. Uh, today's a good hair day. Today's a good hair. I took a shower. I did. I took a shower. I did all kinds of things today. I had to get ready. Uh, uh, having a party this weekend. Birthday party. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but my birthday is on Sunday. So, which means Saturday is the night for the getting down. And uh, it's going to be great. And, man, so I got to prep for that. Uh, I just, you know, have to prep for that. So, in order to prep for that, I had to take a shower. All right. A woman who was hospitalized with life, a life-threatening disease back in 2019, has her aquarium to blame, her fish tank. And all of this is according to experts at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In a recent report, they detail how her freshwater home aquarium was contaminated by the same bacteria that caused her illness known as miliodosis. Hers is one of several recent cases in the United States that have puzzled doctors since Emilio Milioidosis is typically only found in tropical areas. Symptoms of uh, the disease vary significantly, even with timely antibiotic treatment. Milioidosis, that is, so you can go and look this up, M E L I O I dosis is often deadly, with a fatality rate ranging from 10% to over 40%, almost half. Worldwide, it's thought to kill at least around 100,000 people per year. All right. Well, it's happening next week. William Shatner, Captain Kirk, is boldly going where Jeff Bezos has already gone. Blue Origin has announced that the Star Trek captain will fly to space on board the company's new Shepard spacecraft this Tuesday. <laughs> Just like that. This Tuesday, October 12th. Joining him will be Audrey Powers, the company's vice president of mission and flight operations, along with crewmates Chris Bush Bushweisen and Glenn DeVries. And at 90 years old, Captain Kirk, William Shatner, will be the oldest person ever to fly in space. That record's going to hold for a while. Let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to today, one of my favorites, Elizabeth Shue. Elizabeth Shue. Today is 57. And, you know, you think about Elizabeth Shue, you know, leaving Las Vegas or whatever that, the, the movie, you know, Nick Cage drinking. No, that doesn't come to mind. What comes to mind? Jennifer Parker. That's right. Marty McFly's girlfriend in Back to the Future Part 2 and Part 3. 
Bassist Paul Martinez today is 74. And Paul Martinez is one of the greatest bass players in the world. He has played with everybody. But he played on three or four of my favorite records, like, of all time. He played on Robert Plant's Pictures at 11, that bass player. That, 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 that. Paul Martinez. He played on Robert Plant's The Principle of Moments. One of one of Robert's greatest. He played on Robert Plant's Shaken and Stirred. And not only that, he was in the Honey Drippers. That's right. Sea of Love. All right, all right. That's Paul Martinez. He's amazing. Happy birthday, 74 years old. And R.E.O. Speedwagon, the front man, the singer. Kevin Cronin today is 70 years old. On this day in history, 1981, man, I this was one of the most incredible videos I'd ever seen. It's like straight out of a movie, but it happened. Islamic extremists assassinate Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, as he reviews troops on the anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. Parades going by, military parade, there's a truck, stops, a bunch of dudes jump out. Anwar sitting in that little thing with all of his staff, and they're just hurling grenades. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Machine gun. It was crazy. On this day in 1981. Fader fact. Okay, now listen to me. Pepperoni is an American invention. In Italian, pepperoni means... Bell peppers. That's right. You didn't know that, did you? Bell pepper. <laughs> oh, man. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But Italians just have to laugh at, at, at Americans. They just do. <laughs> oh, man. You go to, you go to, you go to Italy. I'm just picturing this. You're like I would like a, I would like a pepperoni pizza with mushrooms and bell peppers. <laughs> pizza comes to the table. It's mushrooms and bell peppers. I'm just saying, they're just laughing at it. They, they would do that. They know, right? Pepper, but they would do that just because I would. All right, tonight our 1500th show. Grant Cameron is our guest. We're going to talk about his new book, but it is our 1500th show. Couldn't imagine a better guest. All right. Grant Cameron is here. Tomorrow night's another fader night with open lines all night long. All right. Let me get my chair in the right spot. My chair. This is the center, the center of the keyboard. There's my logo. There's the camera. Why am I over here? I, I don't know the, the, the clock, the camera, the console, Thing, chair, center, why? I have no idea. None. All right, let me hit this River Moon coffee. <sighs> Rivermoonwellness.com. <sighs> Tonight is our 1500th show. And normally I would say, how did we get here? How did we get here? Well, tonight on this anniversary, I'm going to make an announcement. We have left KGRA. Uh, we let KGRA know last week that we were leaving. We gave them a two-week notice that we were uh, going to air our last show with them on October 13th. That was the plan. Two week notice, do the right thing. You'd be professional. You do all of that stuff. And I didn't want to announce, uh, what we were doing and, and, and things because it's a big deal, but also, uh, just to be professional and show KGRA some respect, you don't announce anything until later. You don't do it. Well, I'm announcing all of this tonight instead of on October 13th because KGRA 
um, just decided to air our last show last night without telling me anything. I still have KGRA drops playing in the show as a courtesy to them and, and wanted to be cool because I am cool and have those air until the 13th and then we leave and then we make the change over. That's being professional, being cool. It's courteous. It's the way to do things. And so now they forced my hand and I'm making this announcement early and, um, and it, yeah, it's simply not cool, but I don't care. Um, what I do care about is being professional. And, uh, tonight on our 1500th show, I had a whole other idea of things and a way to celebrate. I don't want to do it like this, but, uh, so, uh, there's a new network starting. It's being run by race Hobbs. It's called UnX, UNX, the UnX network. And where race goes, Jimmy goes. And and that's it. And we were at KGRA because of Race Hobbs. And and so this new network um is is amazing. Uh I already know things. And the the shows that are lined up, the show uh, the network is going to launch on October 31st. What? Did you hear that? Wow, that was crazy. What? Oh, man. Did you guys hear that? This radio's going off. It's on the emergency channel. What? What? That's crazy. It's a it's a recording on the emergency channel. What? 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 Can he, it's, it's what language is that? Okay. Okay, I got to turn this down. That's uh. We'll, we'll get back to it. Just came out of nowhere. I, I forget what I was talking about. Oh, oh, the new network, Unex. So. Uh, it's launching on October thirty first. Fade to Black is going to be there. Monday through Thursday, uh, four nights a week live. And the the shows <clears throat> that are going to premiere along uh, with Fade to Black that night on October 31st, it's like, whoa. Okay, so I'm just letting everybody know that this is going to be great. And the people that are involved, the show hosts that are involved, and and how this network is is going to present itself is uh, is is paradigm shifting. All right. So uh, again, uh, the website hasn't launched yet. We were, all of this was happening in a, in a week uh, because of. Uh, uh, that that other network, uh, which is very quickly going to be nameless, uh, will, will won't be mentioned anymore on 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 this show. Um, the programming tonight, you're going to hear the KGRA drops, and that's why they are there out of a professional courtesy to to be classy. And tomorrow, those are going to be gone, and 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 that's their choice. It's uh, it's unbelievable. So, and, and by the way, I'm just going to let everybody know. I, uh, I let KGRA know. And it's right here. It says, never contact me again about anything. Didn't have to be that way. I sent them a very cool letter. Very cool. And wow. Wow. Just uncool. So anyway, um, now the 1500th show. If you do the math. And, and we're doing, let's see here, let's, let's do the math. And I was going to do this earlier, but let's do it in real time. If, um, 
We're doing four times 52. That's 208 shows a year. All right, 208 shows a year. And so if you do, uh, if you do, so you go 1,500, yeah, seven, seven point two years. That's uh, that's crazy, and it's it's longer than that because we did three shows a week at one point, uh, for a while, for almost a year. So, yeah, is that a weather emergency? I don't know. I I, I don't know what they were saying. I don't I don't know. <laughs> it's saying low voltage. I, on the emergency channel, I don't know. I don't know. I got to turn down. Okay, um, that's not what I heard. I heard another language. Um, I, I don't even know what language it was. So, fifteen hundred shows, and two hundred uh, shows a year. So, yeah. Well, wait a minute. Seven point two years. No, that. Did. So that would be five more years to add another thousand shows. Yeah, I guess that's about right. Yeah, so two, yeah, two and a half years for us to get to show number uh, two thousand. So we're not going to get to that to two thousand twenty-three. Wow. Uh, yeah, maybe two thousand twenty-four. That's why I'm talking about show number fifteen hundred tonight. And somebody asked me recently, and and I'll I'll just back up and and say this: um, uh, the original ideas uh, for Fade to Black, and they had another name, Jimmy Church Against the World, I, I believe is is what we did. And again, this is eight years ago, nine years ago when we made the changeovers. So, uh, but the original idea behind the show, because I I was doing sports at the time. And I, but, but that's not what I wanted to, I enjoy sports. Um, and, or at least I did. And I wanted a, a way to have like a variety show. I wanted a variety show. And, and I w- was going to do almost like in three hours, I was going to do like a half hour of sports and a half hour of UFOs and a half hour of cryptids and a half hour of ghost and the paranormal and, and a half hour of ancient history, and a half hour of conspiracies. And I was going to break it up like that. I was going to bring in like five guests a night. And that, that, that was the original idea behind it. And uh, obviously that changed it a little bit, uh, changed a lot. But as I thought about things, and that was pretty ambitious. You know, can you imagine booking five guests a night? Uh, for for three, four nights a week live. Whew, uh, it's a lot of work, but it was a great idea. It could still happen. Uh, who knows? But, but anyway, as I thought about this, I was like, why don't I just cover all of these subjects and maybe do them all in one show or maybe do uh, different themes uh, each night of the week? But I could talk about all of these things. And then I made a decision. I made a decision. No sports. And when I made that decision, I want you to uh, think about how, how much I cut sports out of my life. On my birthdays each night, no sports figures. None. Oh, they have birthdays too. None. Do you hear any sports news? None. I cut sports out completely. Sports is not going to be covered on the show. And of course, the other stuff goes along with that. I didn't want to do religion. I didn't want to do politics. I didn't want to do government. I didn't want to do any of that. Unless it was a conspiracy tied to it. And that is how... Originally, before the show launched, how the ideas, you know, you're whiteboarding these ideas, and and what was the show going to be? Well, the show was going to be, from the beginning, things that I enjoy. You know, and maybe that's what the show should have been called, not Fade to Black. Things that I enjoy (laughs) with Jimmy Church. 
and 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 I and that's it. I decided to just talk about the things where I'm comfortable. I don't have to venture out. I don't have to go into something I don't know anything about. I don't have to bring on a guest that I don't know. I don't have to bring on a guest to talk about a subject that I know nothing about. And, uh, you know, for ratings or for numbers of this and that, you know, and, and do it. No, no. I wanted to make sure that I only talked about the stuff that makes me happy. That's it. And, and eventually, and we start off with one listener, that eventually there would be uh, a collection of, of, of people in this audience that also like the same things that I do. And eventually over time, I would, I would make that connection so that the people that are here, which are, you know, today it's the fader knots, that the people that are here get it. And if you don't get it, don't listen. But, but it's, 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 it's UFOs, it's lost history, it's the paranormal, it's time travel, it's, it's food, it's, it's guitars, it's music, it's heavy metal, it's all music, it's all, all things. It, it's great films and great TV series and great breakfast cereal. The things that make me happy, that I know a lot about and that I want to talk about and I want to find out more about these things. And as it turns out... I was thinking, man, well, maybe there's a couple of people out there like that. Well, it turns out that there is a lot. And and the show uh, obviously grew and continued, but we, we were able to do this four nights a week and and just stay in my comfort zone. And, and so when that happens, and I'm already blowing past a commercial break, um, when that happens... I'm more comfortable, and so is the audience. You guys, you guys know what to expect every single night. You're going to get some goofiness. You're going to get some seriousness. You're going to get a rant. You're going to get some cool news. Uh, you're going to get some cool birthdays that don't include sports. You're going to get, <laughs> you're going to get all of that, and and every single night at 7 p.m. Pacific time, it happens, and we will be here, and we've done that now for eight years. Tonight's our 1500th show. I want to thank all of you. I'm humbled, honored, surprised, and very happy. It's our 1500th show tonight with Grant Cameron. And uh, we're going to be talking about his new book that he wrote with Nicole Sakic. It is called Triangles, Aliens, and Messages. We're going to do all of that and much more tonight with Grant. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'm KJCR. The Game Changer Network, and soon to be on X. No more KGRA. That's in the rear view mirror. I'll be right back after this short break with Grant Cameron. Stay with us. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. 
with wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan small batch roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2B blend for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. This is the only way forward. This is Made to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, folks. It's troubling times, and fear is pushing emotions, which in turn pushes health the wrong direction. Do you ever get an ache because life is uneasy? Try Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea works on your digestive tract, helping to move food through quicker and comfortably so your health is spot on. Life Change Tea may not help with world issues, but it will help with your digestive issues. A glass a day helps keep the intruders away. So, change your life today. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. If your health game is off, get on by ordering Life Change Tea. GetTheTea.com. And while you're on our site, look around at the great non-GMO organic supplements. And if you're a sales shopper, go to our specials page and see what's for you. I've been drinking the tea for 12 years, and I'm sure glad for its health benefits. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. GetTheTea.com. The tea that makes you go. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than in a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Matthew. You're You're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight is our 1500th show. Big night tonight with the very best. Grant Cameron is joining us. We're talking about his uh, new book, co-author with Nicole Sockett, Triangles, Aliens, and Messages, but it's Grant, which means this conversation is going to go wherever it's going to go. I love it. Grant has been a UFO researcher since 1975. And he has recognized uh, as both uh, the Leeds Conference International Researcher of the Year and the UFO Congress Researcher of the Year. World-renowned expert on UFOs, conspiracies, government cover-ups. Lately, it's been about consciousness and music. We're going to get to all of that. He has spent decades watching and chronicling all of the developments around the extraterrestrial world. And, of course, he is also the author of Charlie Red Star. And his new book that we're going to be talking about tonight. And uh, all of his links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. We've got them up in uh, social media. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, Grant Cameron, fresh off the road from uh, a football match. How you doing, Grant? 
Just fine, Jimmy. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Man, good to see you again. Yeah, it's, it's good to see you. And and uh, it was so funny because I called you uh, both during and after uh, the match up there in Canada. Yeah. And I was fully jealous, man. I mean, you're out there, uh, uh, you know, after everything that has gone down in the last couple of years, getting out and, and doing something like that is pretty cool. Um, how did that feel to... Uh, you know, walk down streets and, and go into a, a giant arena and participate well, in public events. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's better in Canada. Once you're, when you're in your own country, you can move around, uh, without much restriction. I was just actually last month in Illinois at the big metaphysical tribe conference there. And that was like, just horrible. I mean, it was like, uh, COVID test going in COVID test coming back, uh, hassled by us, uh, um, Homeland Security again. So I said at that point, I said no more lecturing in the States because basically um, I thought I was going to get sent home because I have, as you know, I was refused entry in 2005 coming to L.A. And basically what they're what they've told me now is if I accept a plane ticket, a, a dinner, a, a hotel room, I'm getting paid and I don't have a green card and you're going home. So. It was, uh, it was, it was a horrible situation, but, uh, inside Canada, when I, I was going to see my son there, the weird thing about there is it's Vancouver and it's probably the same in LA. Uh, everybody's looking at million dollar houses and I'm going like, I can't believe this. You know, my kids, uh, they're out looking on Saturday, Sunday for a, at a house, $1.2 million. And that's 30 miles out of Vancouver. It's just like crazy. It's like gone insane. And, and, and how big was it like a $1.2 million house or, or was it like some tiny little. No, it, it was a like a regular house with 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 a yard, but the the condo they're in, it's just a two bedroom condo, like a, we call them chicken houses. You know, they're all one all stacked together, and that was five hundred sixty thousand dollars. So, I mean, the real estate there has just gone uh, totally um, insane. And everybody, I guess everybody's uh, figuring we can buy it now, and if, it, if things get bad, we can sell it for two hundred thousand dollars equity next year. It's uh, so it was good to see my son. He moved out there. Everybody in Canada, like I live in the coldest major city in the world. And uh, my son was pretty glad to get out of here. And now he's in the uh, the big city where it's, uh, you know, warm all the time. And uh, so good for him. Uh, and and congratulations uh, on that. Uh, here in L.A., I don't want to dwell on it. But here in Los Angeles, if you're in L.A. County, um, I'm just going to throw this out there. Like in the city of Burbank, an 1,100-square-foot house. 1,100 square feet, right? Smaller than my first apartment. <laughs> 1,100 square feet, 1. 1.5 million. Wow. And, you know, I'm talking about two bedrooms, one bath, right? I, I, yeah. Smaller than you can even think about. And now, look, when you look at, you know, uh, Tokyo and Hong Kong and, and, yeah. and, and, and Moscow or London and, and New York, these kind of prices don't really surprise you, uh, but but you're in a major metropolitan city. I'm talking about anywhere in L.A. You know, yeah. pick a city, and uh, and and this is the other part. There's no inventory. There are no houses to buy, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's absolutely crazy. And with you know, the economy seems to be doing pretty good worldwide. And considering yeah. everything that we went through, um, you wouldn't think that people have that kind of money housing prices have doubled in the last year you know yeah and it's crazy i i know and one of the things i i'm always famous for my mcdonald's first thing i do in the morning i i walk off to mcdonald's and it's got to be like um you know a mile and a half two miles away so i walk up this hill straight up this hill for 25 minutes i thought i was going to die because i live in a completely flat city there's no hills at all walked up there i thought i was going to die i'm sweating i you know my heart's palpitating i get to mcdonald's and it says opens at 11 o'clock i went what <laughs> so i told my son and he said well they can't hire anybody right they're paying 16 dollars an hour uh but who can afford you know to uh work for that kind of money so a lot of the restaurants are only open for one shift a day it's kind of it's just a weird you know, situation it's, it's the same thing all over and uh fortunately in the town that i'm in now um don't have those issues but i did over the last uh I was up in Northern California, and one of the things that we have here in California, which is great, it's a it, it's this horrible restaurant called Jack in the Box, and, <laughs> and they have a late night pothead menu and and things, yeah. and it, it's cool, and they're open twenty four hours a day. 
except up in Northern California. They're, they, you know, they're closing at nine o'clock. They, they can't hire anybody. They, wow. they, they just, nobody wants to work. Um, so anyway, all right, enough, uh, enough of all of that. How are you doing? <laughs> How are you doing? I, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Everything's going well. And, uh, we're putting out a lot of books here. I'm just, uh, I was doing the podcast and I stopped that cause I just suddenly got an inspiration. I've got three books coming one after another and, uh, we're putting them up pretty fast. The one we're going to talk about tonight was, uh, triangles, which took two and a half weeks. It was like really fast. I mean, so, well, when you, when, when, when you're in the zone, right. Yeah. When you're in the zone. Yeah. Um, and, and also, well, a couple of things tonight is our 1500th show grant. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be on the 1500th show. Yeah. And it's an honor <laughs> to have you here. And I don't know how many shows and things that we've done in the past. We've certainly done. Um, a lot of them, but to get to 1500, you know, yeah. and so for most people that are doing a podcast, you know, for one, you know, once a week, yeah. uh, uh, 1500 is going to take them how many years, yeah. <laughs> right? How many years? It's a lifetime, uh, to yeah. get to 1500, 1500 television shows, 1500, the 1500 episodes of fade to black. And, and I, I don't know how we pulled it off, but, uh, and, it, well, and I think it's important because I mean, that's the way I look at it. Like with the books, uh, I don't intend to sell a lot of books or the podcast is you're trying to record history. So when you got 1500, I, I always refer to the one show you did that I have used in my piles of my books. And that was the one you did with, uh, Tom DeLong. Mm-hmm. And I think it was 2016. I have quoted from that interview numerous times. So you got some interviews that, are historic interviews that you've done with a number of people. And that's what it's basically about. Cause we may not figure this thing out in our lifetime, but you've recorded your, your, your position, your, you, you got to play in the big game. I call it the big super bowl that we're in the super bowl. We got to play, record your story. I always tell experiencers, have you written this down for your kids? And they go, well, I'm thinking about it. And I said, no, write it down. I mean, even if you, cause now it's self publishing, you can just make one book or whatever, write your story down. It will help you organize your story and to record this history, because 500 years from now, people are going to think we were the luckiest people in the world to have lived at this time and dealt with these these bizarre subjects as they unfolded. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a time capsule. It's it's part of the public domain. It's frozen in time. And they occur, uh, the shows specifically occur at a time when something is a subject, right? And it gets covered in, in a deep way. I have been, uh, trust me, Grant, uh, I, I want to thank you. Uh, numerous times people have sent me uh, clips and video of you speaking somewhere and, and bringing up fade to black and, and I'll yep. watch this, this fade to black, uh, whatever the episode is uh, conversation happening with the other panelists that have also listened to the show. And it's not because of fade to black. It's your point. It's that it w- what was mentioned that night on the show. And, and that's what's important because it becomes part of the public domain and everybody can reference back to it. And you've yeah. done it many times, man. And I uh, yeah. don't think I haven't noticed. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I, I, I that's what I do is, is to me, it's always research when I hear and I say, when did uh, Tom DeLong say that? And I'm thinking, did he say it on Coast to Coast? Did he say it on Jimmy Church? And I start going back. And so I've listened to that podcast numerous times. And I know how to get through it fast by using a word search and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But it's historic where... Um, so he said some stuff back in those days, which he doesn't talk about anymore. I mean, you, that was, I think one of the most important interviews I've ever heard done was that first one you did with, with Tom DeLong. It was a lot of stuff where he talked about how this thing unfolded. He doesn't talk about that. And that's historic stuff because I mean, it was the Tom DeLong thing that got this whole thing going that, that we're talking about today with the Senate and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's where it happened and you recorded it while it was happening. And, uh, you, <laughs> I don't know, man. I think your shows on Fade to Black have been pretty dang epic. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, like uh, this week, and, and and you brought up a really good point. Um, and I want to thank Nicole. She needs some props. Uh, I know she's listening right now. Uh, she's dynamic and she's cool. And, and I had a chance to uh, really get to know her and break some bread and uh, for about a week. And and she's just uh, just amazing. And her and I had a chance to, I don't know, you probably don't know this, Grant, but her and I were, uh, were take a break buddies, right? So it was like, <laughs> you want to get out of here? Yes. And yeah. so we would go and stand down by the river and, uh, and just talk. 
and it, 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 you know, five minutes, ten minutes, forty-five minutes, you know, uh, <laughs> and that's just the way that she is. But I really got to know her, and uh, she is absolutely amazing. So, uh, props to Nicole, the co-author, uh, with you on this new book, uh, Nicole Sockage, and yeah. uh, Triangles, well, Aliens, and Messages. Yeah, that. The, well, the point is, the book would not have happened if it weren't for her. Because as you know, this uh, how this thing happened. I even asked her, I, I had forgotten what had happened. And I said, well, how did this book come to be? And this is this whole story. You know how they were, they always dangled the story. They put out the story. Uh, what's going to happen? The leak. And the leak was the story of the triangle of, uh, photograph that was coming. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, nah, 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 nah. We got this photo and it's coming out. And they were going to, and then I was talking to Nicole and, and she said, oh, Bob McGuire has seen that photo. I said, Bob McGuire seen that photo? And she says, yeah. And I said, can you get him for an interview? And she said, yeah, I can get him. So we had the interview with Bob McGuire, and that's when Twitter blew up, and people were saying, oh, you scooped these guys' stories. Well, they were throwing the story out, and we mm -hmm. just went with Bob McGuire on the triangle story. And then I realized I had had a triangle incident myself that I'd completely forgotten about in 1976, which is a very dramatic sighting. And then I'm thinking, why don't we put a panel? And that's when we put it up, and Nicole sort of handled that. We put up a panel, and all these people came forward and said, oh, I've had a triangle sighting. And we started to realize there's these important um Things that had happened, like three of the top reporters, like Lee Spiegel, had a major triangle sighting. Billy Cox, that's how his career started, with this gigantic triangle sighting right outside of NASA on the on the coast there. In Florida. And, and, yep. and the third one was uh, Green Street from New York Post. That's how his whole, he got down the rabbit hole with this giant triangle sighting. And it started to unfold, almost like this, they wanted us to do the story. And it, that's where the thing was. We did a couple of panels. And all these people came forward. They told these stories. And uh, we just said, let's record this for history. Rather than just having it on YouTube, let's record it. And everybody can can see. But it's, it's fairly significant because it a, it's a different type of um, thing. People uh, who haven't been in it as long as I have don't realize that things have changed. Everybody thinks it's the same UFO story. And it's not. You had, you had in 1895, you had in 86, you had the wooden ships with the propellers and the, the sails on them. Then you had the, the, the Foo Fighters, they went away. Then the green fireballs came, then they went away. Then you had the Adamski crafts and they went away. Then you had the crafts with the windows, then they went away. And, and then the triangle started to appear. And, the, and now you have all these big triangle sightings with these huge, massive triangles with, uh, you know, miles across and stuff like that. And people seem to forget that, that, that it's almost like they're unfolding something. Somebody's they're, they're changing the scenario as it goes along. And now this orb thing, once we have the, the digital camera, suddenly all these people have these orb photographs that they're that they're putting out. And people always think it's always the same thing, but I've been in it so long, I know that these patterns have occurred and that for whatever reason, it's almost like um, they're changing it up. They say, okay, now let's do this. And it, it changes. Like crop circles haven't always been here. Uh, landing traces, one of the things I, I mentioned about si triangles, that triangles, uh, um, um, the, the statement was made that triangles never, never land. There's only one that we know that may have landed, and that was... Um, Terry Lovelace's story. Uh, but when you listen to Terry Lovelace's story, when he was inside the craft, he said it was the size of a football stadium on the inside and it was just a regular craft on the outside, which tends to indicate it may not have been as physical as it, it may have been this matrix that people talk about. The Because people talk about it in the spirit world. I've got a guy who the aliens took him into the spirit world and he's with his dead mother and he went into this building and he said, I was in this building. It was 10 times the size inside as it was outside. And I said, hey, that's what Terry Lovelace said. Same thing. So is he in a UFO abduction experience? Is he in the spirit world? And you start to realize that the, there's these important things. And this this idea that triangles don't don't land and that very few abductions, to Terry Lovelace should be the only ones with abductions, like the Phoenix Lights big case. There was no abduction stuff connected to that. Mm -hmm. And you start seeing these weird patterns and you wonder like, like, what's this all about? Or even the idea, a lot of people don't know, I always bring out that, you remember Stanton Friedman used to talk about that physical evidence, the 4,000 landing trace cases. Well, there's not been a landing trace in 25 years. There's not been anything land in 25 years. The things fly around the sky, but you don't really get these landings like Rendlesham Forest or the Falcon Lake incident or, um, you know, where they used to land and, and put the tripod marks and burn out the crop and stuff. That hasn't happened for years. I remember talking to Ted Phillips 15 years ago, and he's the guy that collected most of them. I said, Ted, is it, am I mistaken or is this thing shut down? And he said, yeah, I think you're right. I don't, there's, there's the odd one, but basically it stopped. It's almost like they're, they're changing the scenario. Okay, now let's do something else. Instead of, instead of landing traces, we're going to do crop circles. And that's the, the kind of stuff that really 
sort of catches my attention when I'm working in UFOs is these weird little patterns or the, you know, the one with the, with the, like Chris Bledsoe, you interviewed him. Same thing. Chris Bledsoe went inside the craft. And it was huge on the inside of the craft and he looked outside and it was small and he looked inside and it, it was huge. And those kind of things I think are very important, especially when you get multiple people telling those stories that something here we can learn what is actually going on here if the craft is like the size of a football field inside and it's 30 feet across on the outside. That is something I think is significant that will tell us what may be going on here. That's what they do with the houses in Burbank, right? <laughs> it's 1,100 square feet on the outside for $1.5 million, but you walk in, 15,000 square feet. It's, <laughs> it's this new technology, Grant. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, but yes, and, and here, I mean, for me, uh, and I understand the transitions, uh, and for all of us that have been, uh, you know, in the UFO game for a while, and others too, they, you don't have to be in it forever, but we have seen uh, the the changes over the years. And, and not to say that those changes aren't significant, because intelligent civilizations all can't be driving the same Ford Fiesta, right? Uh, you, the, the crafts are going to be different probably every single time they are here. One of the things that has been pretty consistent is is the triangle. And if if you go back, um, and and you're right about you know the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, and the 80s, but if you go back and look at the Rhodes photographs in July of 1947 that were taken in Phoenix, yeah. I, I would say that that's a black triangle. Yeah, you know, yeah. and 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 that's 1947. I myself have had my own uh, black triangle sighting, and I didn't know it was a black triangle. I, I've, I've mentioned this to you before until later when I looked at the photograph. What I saw was a black dot moving at a very high altitude with my friends. And and once I looked at the photograph, uh, which I have uh, to this day, uh, 35 millimeter, um, it's a triangle. It's a black triangle at a very high altitude. And, you know, what, what's it? And, and it didn't uh, grant at, at that altitude. It stopped at the edge of this cloud. I'm going to say 60,000 feet, like high, right? High. Not, yeah. um, but it stopped. It, it, it was zipping and it slowed down and then stopped. It's just a black dot and then goes straight up. Burp. Right. Okay. So I snapped a bunch of pictures. Uh, only one had it in it. And I have, I have a series of pictures of clouds, right? But this yeah. one's got this black dot. I put the jeweler's loop on it. It's a black triangle, you know? Yeah. And so what exhibits that kind of flight characteristic where it's going to stop, you know, at that altitude, flying at that speed, zipping across the sky and then stop and then go straight up. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And, and yeah. the other question uh, that I need to throw back at you do you feel that when we talk about black triangles today, that the general consensus is we're probably not talking about extraterrestrials, you know, cruising around our atmosphere, but that this is advanced technology that is ours? Do you think that's where we have kind of moved into? No, I, I, I don't believe the advanced technology very much. I, the, the more I look at it, the less I believe we have, that we're, it's military bravado. Um, I think that, especially if you've got a craft like the Phoenix Lights or some of the ones in the book, I mean, the, the guy said you, could, you couldn't see each end of it. It was that big. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or 40, people, people describing 30 miles or 40 miles across. Mm -hmm. There's, well, why would you build that kind of stuff? Because what you're building, I think, it's at, at Area 51 is drone technology where you, you've got very small, very mobile, under subsonic and stuff like that. This makes no sense, even for, for, for uh, ET intelligence to build something that big. Why would you take something that big, if you're the military, and fly it a couple hundred feet over, the, over, the, over Phoenix, Arizona? You're going to have it in a restricted air, airspace where you, you, in case it crashes or whatever, the, the, it's always this thing about uh, you know, um, the risk potential of, of flying it. There's no way you're going to take the chance of flying that thing over a major city. And so to me, I, I always, but I look at the theory of, wow, I think that the, the whole idea, like even your UFO sighting or my UFO sighting, I always ask people when you, when you had your UFO, what was it doing? And they go, wasn't doing anything. 
It was just sitting there. And it was like, and it was like, do you think it wanted you to see it? And you go, yeah, I yeah, think it yeah. wanted me to see it. And that's where I'm saying that they just throw this stuff. They drag you down the rabbit hole. And it, to me, to me, a lot of the stuff doesn't mean anything. Cause I, 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 and I, a lot of the stuff I get comes to me in sort of inspirations. Like for example, when I had my first sighting and you were, uh, we can talk about this thing about, um, you were talking with Kevin Day the other night about the, the, um, the UFO that, that jumped from, uh, 80,000 feet down to sea level in seven eighths of a second. Well, we had that in Manitoba on film going the other way. And that's what got me involved. So I go out there and the first night, the thing flies right in front of the car. And I'm just like floored. I can't, I can't believe it. So the second night, and I didn't realize this for 40 years, the second night it, it, we, we took a bunch of people out and I said, Oh, we got to see this. All my friends went home later and we were standing there and we we're watching. And then this, this flash and it changed. So it was a flash. It was jumping around the sky, this flashing thing. And then it, as it got in closer, then it changed to this other object. So it was two different objects. It was one object and it changed to this other object and it came right at me. And then it made this left-hand turn and it sort of flew off into the Northeast and I'm watching this thing and I'm going, What's it doing? It's not doing anything. It's just sort of flying along. And then 40 years later, I'm thinking to myself, why did it come directly at me and then make the turn? If it wanted, why didn't it just go from the west into the northeast in a straight line? It right. made this come right at me within about, uh, I don't know, maybe a thousand yards or maybe less than that. And then made this turn and just slowly flew off. And then you start to think, oh, maybe that was intentional. Maybe they wanted me to to pick this up. Because when you see these things like Bud Hopkins sighting, if you know the one that, that dragged him down the rabbit hole in 1964 or whatever, the thing sitting above the car. And what was it doing? It's nothing. He's driving these British people in the car and it's sitting above him in plain daylight. And it's just sitting there. And and he goes out, you know, he goes down the rabbit hole. And that's why I think a lot of this stuff is, is they're just like, why do UFOs have lights on them? So you can see them. They want you to see them. They, this is, this is triggering people and people who have UFO sightings, like even Kevin Day, he has the one experience and he ended up getting divorced as I did, as a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you're, you're a better half can't handle it. You go down the rabbit hole, you're obsessed with it. And that's, that's what I think they're doing is they're dragging people down there. And these are their messengers that are out there telling the story about what they saw. And it's raising consciousness to the fact that we're not alone. Something's going on. And then you and I are spending our whole lives trying to figure out what is going on. Like, I, I got to figure this thing out. And you're obsessed and you can't let it go. Even uh, you know, people always made the joke. They said, oh, the, the guy's left. He's had it. He's finished with UFOs. I go, yeah, right. Don't worry. Nobody leaves. He's coming back. <laughs> He'll be he back. may be gone for a couple of years. He's coming back. <laughs> and let's take a break right here. Our 1500th show. With the one, the only, Grant Cameron. It's going to be great tonight. Looking forward to the rest of this conversation. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and soon to be on X Network. That network launches October 31st. Take a quick break. We'll be right back with more with Grant after this. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. KGRADB.com. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. 
Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Hello, I'm You're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. <laughs> Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and soon to be on X Network. I'll keep everybody posted. Uh, our guest tonight, our 1500th show, is Grant Cameron. And this is the deal. Uh, during the break, uh, Grant uh, got to see me uh, pull up a stepladder. Uh, did you see me do that, Grant? Were you watching? Uh, you, before the show, you were doing that. I saw you in the stepladder. I didn't see you during the break. But. Oh, yeah. I had to do it during the break. I had uh, a light go out. And, uh-huh. and, uh, and I'm like, in the commercial break, I'm like, what? And uh, <laughs> so I'll break out the stepladder. Grant, you know, the show's going on the commercial, and I'm up on, you know, changing. <laughs> like, if people could see me now. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Um, uh, it, it's just an honor to have you here tonight, Grant. And you mentioned something. I want to jump back um, and talk about this triangle sighting for you in 1976, um, because this wasn't Charlie Red Star, right? This is yeah. another sighting, and and triangles. Uh, you you bring up a really good point. I don't think anybody's been abducted yet. I I don't, I don't know of a triangle abduction experience. Um, nothing violent, right? Nothing offensive. Um, 
They're just well, Terry, there. Terry Lovelace talks about the abduction with, with his Oh, trial. that's right. No, so, Terry Lovelace. That's right. That's right. But it's very rare. And it's very rare that they land, which is uh, Marler pointed that out, that triangles don't land. But that seems to be the same thing with UFOs now, that UFOs, you, people see them flying around, but you very rarely see them landing on the ground. So, And that's changed from when I did my book in the Charlie Red Star in the 70s. I mean, I think I had about 10 cases in just the towns around this small town mm -hmm. where they were, you know, landing on the ground, burning out crops, leaving tripod marks and stuff like that. And I noticed after that that, I mean, th what happened to these things? So uh, that's the, uh, the, the the sort of the significant part that it's this this change. But you're talking about the sighting in 76. And the other thing that that's interesting about it is, is this idea of perception. Because I remember um, when the, when it happened, it started with Charlie Red Star. So it was this red plasma uh, uh, object. And then in 76, these small balls started to appear on the ground. And we, we called them ground lights because nobody had used the word orb. We had, didn't know what orbs were at the time. Mm -hmm. Now everybody's talking about orbs like they're, they've been around. They were not around because we didn't even call them orbs. We called them ground lights. And they were really reactive. We could flash lights at them and they would flash back and they would respond and, and we could do all sorts of stuff. We called them tricks. And we were taking infrared photographs and color photographs and trying to surround these things. And in the end, I just gave up. And that's when I joined uh, UFO Sighting Anonymous and gave up on UFO sightings because we people would say, oh, come on, let's go and look at these lights. And, I'd, and then they'd say, oh, it's a car. And they say, no, it's not a car. And they'd say, yeah, it's a car. And i go, no. And then they'd, af after five minutes, I'd say, you still think it's a car? And they say, no, it's not a car. It's a farm light. And then we'd go through that and it would be the same procedure every time. And it was just like a waste of time. And so I would tell them, okay, you want to go see this thing? Here's where it is. Drive down Highway 3, turn to 205, go two miles, head toward the U.S. border, and good luck. And I'm not going. I, I'm tired of this stuff. But the one night we were we were driving around, and I was with these uh, four kids. One of them actually is, has, has passed away since then, but they were much younger than I was. I was maybe 22, and they were about 14, 15 and they lived on the street. So I would, all these kids would say, can we come, can we come UFO sighting? And I'd be going out there basically every second day. Cause I basically just shut down university and said, man, I gotta, I gotta, this is the biggest story I've ever seen. And I was chasing this thing. So we had these, what were called ground lights on the ground. And I, I took the one kid out and, um, I showed him how you could flash three times. And it would flash back three times. You could take the light from side to side and it would move like a, like a leaf back and forth. And it would, it, one would do the tricks and the other would, would sort of dim down. There would always be two of them. And, um, so I had the one kid out there showing me these tricks. I put him back in the car and then the, I took the second, his brother out. And as I was showing him, this thing started making this wh whistling beeping noise, which I'd never heard. I'd never heard any noise from it. And it was like a Morse code, but it was a whistling noise. And I, and it was just instantaneous fear. It was like, like people, you'll hear people describe this as, as scared as you can possibly get. And I go, Oh no, I've, I've upset this thing. Mm -hmm. Now the big one's going to come down. And I looked up on the, on the American border. We're facing the American border. I looked up and there's this huge arc welding light on the, on the border. And I go, then it was just total panic city. And I go, Oh no, like, uh, and, and I'm, these kids aren't going to get abducted. And that was when Travis, Travis hadn't even been, no, Travis was taken a couple months before that. But uh, so we had some idea about abductions. But again, there was really no abductions. There was the Pascagoula thing. It was tied into uh, the, the nuclear weapons. Travis Walton was tied into nuclear weapons. Uh, the Betty and Barney Hill had been done. But there was really no abductions at that point. We really didn't know much about it. We didn't know about missing time. That didn't happen until the 1980s. So I said, oh, we're going to get abducted. I shouldn't have done this. Uh, these kids aren't coming home or whatever. And uh, so we went back into the car. And I remember this thing was going along. And the weird thing was, is you'll hear this about perception, where you describe it and then somebody besides you, the one kid, actually becoming an aeronautical engineer, he went to Finland, became, and he had come home to his mother's house on my street. And I saw him and I said, hey, Brian, you, you remember that uh, sighting we had? And he said, oh, yeah, I remember that. And he, he started talking and said, hang on, I'll, I'm going to put you on tape. I don't want you to tell me. I'd never talked to him about it. And when he described the sighting, he described this metal with blue lights. And I go, blue lights? There was no blue lights. <laughs> I didn't say anything to him, but I, he saw something almost completely different than I saw. But the thing it made this sort of a turn. It, it came around. It started as an arc welding light. And this is the thing about lights in the sky is that they will actually change shape. They'll change color. And it started as this arc welding light. And as it came around, it shot a blue beam down onto these two lights on uh, that we were sh flashing lights at. And then it made the turn. I'm going, no, no, don't, don't, don't turn, don't turn. And it made the turn and it came around and all of a sudden it was coming down the road very, very low. 
And I'm telling you, totally petrified. I told the kids, I said, and, and we knew nothing about triangles. So there may have been triangle sightings before. I had never heard about a triangle sighting. Didn't know anything about triangles. It was coming down the road. And, and I said to them, give me my binoculars. And I remember I was shaking so bad. I had to hold the binoculars on the inside of the glass of the car. And I'm looking straight up and I'm trying to hold the binoculars still. And I'll tell you, Jimmy, it was either very low or it was very big because it was the entire field of vision. That's all it was, was these, these huge lights, two red lights on the front and a green light in the back. And it was flying as most people would describe the triangle It's flying backwards. So the point is facing away. So the front end, the flat edge of the triangles coming at us and it was right above the car and it was above the, it was sitting above the car and I'm looking up at this thing. And then I described this almost like the, 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 the Oz effect. When you start to realize this thing may not be as physical and it may not be as as clear cut as we think it is, because what happened is it was sitting there and it made like a uh, there was a pilot who uh, had an experience where the thing flew in front of the plane. The plane stopped. You could see the, the prop just slowly going. And then it went back together. And he said it was like putting a film together and it jerked and this, and, and he, he, pet, he got petrified. It was exactly that same sort of thing. It was sitting there and it was just a slight move, just tiniest move like they'd taken a film and put it back together and the fear was instantaneously gone there was no fear whatsoever it just gone and then the thing started to slowly move away and it was moving towards this microwave tower and that's when the royal, royal canadian mount of police that came in and uh, the royal canadian mount of police was filing sightings and stuff and um the, the, he came he comes up behind the car and i said watch i'm gonna get this guy so he ro i rolled down the window and he puts the flashlight in the car and he says so what's going on here? Because we're in the middle of nowhere. Like there's nothing. There's not a house within. And this five is miles this away. is in Manitoba. This is in Manitoba, yeah. And it'd be about maybe 20 miles north of the uh, North Dakota border. Okay. In the yeah. middle of farmland, flat as can be, no hills, no nothing. What what and town what town were you living in then? I still lived in the city. So it was the well, what had happened was. Oh, you drove uh, down I, from Winnipeg. Yeah. Okay. And this happened about 35 miles southwest. It was the, Carmen was the main town where this thing started. And where we had this experience was maybe 11 miles closer to the city. But this uh, guy came up, this Royal Canadian Mounted Police guy came up. And I had been written up in the paper there as being the guy who was going to jump on this thing. I was close to one of these orbs. I was so close I was going to jump on it. And it was maybe two and a half feet across. I was within a couple of feet of this thing. I had an 8 millimeter movie camera going. And uh, I was going to jump on it, and then it ran this little diversion and and escaped. But uh, so I said to him, "Watch, I'm going to get this guy." And I, he, I think he realized that I was the guy who was written up in the paper because I, I said, he said, "What's going on here?" And I said, "See that object there?" And it's this triangle, clear as day. You can still see this triangle, the two red lights and the green light, and it's flying towards this microwave tower. He says, "Yeah, I see it." And then I said, "Oh, we're just watching these lights down at the end of the road." And he said, "What lights?" And so I said. Well, turn, turn your lights off on your car. And he had like the flashers were going and stuff. And he said, okay. So he turns off the car and the, the lights, whatever. And then I take them and it's completely black. And I take the flashlight, put it up in the air, put it back down. And this light appears and it goes up into the air, goes right. back down. And this guy looks. And then I do it again, side to side. And he looks again. And then he says, oh, probably just a couple of guys down at the end of the road having a beer. And I said, well, we've been chasing it for eight, six miles. And he goes. Oh, okay. I guess we'll see you guys. <laughs> no, no ID check, nothing. He turns around, he starts going towards the car. And I said to the kids, get his license plate number. And off they go. And they start running towards the car and he jumps in the car. And this is a federal police officer and takes off the gravel's flying. And he just didn't want to get, he realized he'd been suckered into this thing of admitting that he'd seen this, this triangle flying along, but it was an, it was an important time. Like you were talking with Kevin day. I want to mention this because, um, you, you talked about this thing where it, it dropped down. The reason I went out there, and I believe it had to do with nuclear weapons, but there, I, I was supposed to go out in February. That's when they put in the, uh, the 100 new nuclear missiles into North Dakota. North Dakota was a, was a nuclear superpower. It had 300 Minuteman nuclear silos with three warheads on them each. And in 1975, they put in the only anti-ballistic missile unit that ever went operational in the United States. They were supposed to put one in Malmstrom. They didn't put it in. But the North Dakota, at Cools Root, North Dakota, they put in 100 new nuclear missiles. That's when all the UFO sightings started on our side of the border. And it went on till November, the high point. In November, they made an agreement with the Russians. They started taking these missiles out. That's when the sightings t toned off and, and, and went away. But um, what had happened was uh, we were going to go out in February, February. And I said to my friend, I had no interest in UFOs. I just said, hey, let's go see what everybody's looking at. Because we used to drive around the big city. Nothing to do. I said, let's go out to Carmen and see what these people are looking at. And I always said it was like buying the lottery ticket. I'm going to buy the lottery ticket, but I'm not going to win. We'll go there. We're not going to see anything. But let's let's just go and see what's going to go on. So we uh, what had happened was 
uh, there was TV crews. There was the 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 Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the government uh, TV station, had tried to get it, and the 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 private station CKY affiliate had gone out and they were trying to capture this thing because it was there all the time. Mm -hmm. And CKY just about got it. And then they they went back to the news producer and they said, oh, we got we almost got it last night. We almost got it on film. And then the guy said, that's it. No more. No more overtime. This garbage. You guys want to go and chase stupid UFOs. You can go on your own time. So they got a crew together of volunteer uh, reporters. And the guy, the, 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 the cameraman was actually a film editor. He'd never shot one of these big cameras in the 1970s, these big TV cameras. He'd never shot one before in his life. And they had set up there. And I remember the, the, the guy that was sh shooting it, uh, they, they'd gone down, it was sitting on the, on the ground. They could see it was on the ground and they'd send in, uh, cars, one on the North side of it, one on the South side of it to try to surround it. And he's watching this thing and he says, Oh, last night they almost got something. So it was going up, it was glowing up and it would glow back down and glow up and glow back down. He said, next time it glows up, I'm going to shoot. And it was almost like the UFO said, you ready? Cause he, he pushed the trigger and the thing jumped in the air. So what we had was you had the Nimitz go from 80,000 down to sea level. This went, according to the reports, we haven't got the exact data. We may have to get someone like like uh, uh, Bob McGuire to do the exact data. It was eight and a quarter miles away. It went from the bottom of the frame to the top of the frame in three frames, one eighth of a second. It went from the bottom. The second was a flat, what we call a flash frame. The whole horizon lights up for one frame of film. And in the, in the third frame, it's at the top. What we heard, it went from ground level to 5,000 feet in three frames, one eighth of a second. So that's, we got it on a film and that was a film. And I remember the, the film guy, I went to get a copy of the film from him and he said, no, I don't wanna make any film. Every time I make a copy for the people, this thing disappears. And then he tells the story of J. Allen Hynek coming. That Jalen Heineck, and he didn't trust Jalen Heineck. Jalen Heineck had come to get this film, but he he was really pressuring him. He wanted not one copy, he wanted two copies of the film. So he gave it to Jalen Heineck. I got a copy from me, finally made a third generation copy for me of this 12 seconds of film where this thing jumps up in the air and it goes flying across the sky. And uh, when I sold my house, you think I could find that six inch reel with that tape on? It was gone. But it is on a documentary that Jacques Vallée actually narrates. It's on this, uh, I believe it was a CIA dump of information, UFO cover up live. That doc, that video is on there and it's three frames of film. It's spectacular. And that's why I went out when I saw the film, because the, the TV station had done a major documentary on it, eight minutes. And they're going frame by frame, how this thing was going on a wave and it's flashing as it's going on this wave. And they, they broke it down frame by frame. And then the, the, the NBC picked it up. It went viral and they actually gave the guy 50 bucks because nobody got paid. And they said, keep your mouth shut. NBC is going to interview you about this film, the guy who shot it, whatever. So, of course, when the guy left, he took the film with him. So when I went to see I said, you got that film? He said, no, we can't find it. It's missing. <laughs> and I think the the guy that shot it figured, like, I never got paid for this thing. I took it anyway. So that's the thing is, is this is what I call a theory of wow, where they're just showing off. It's like just bizarre. They allowed themselves to get caught in the ground. And that's what got me out. I would not have gone if it had not been for them capturing that thing, jumping in the air. Because when I saw it, I said, come on, let's go. Come on. We, it's still there. Let's go and see what's going on. And the first night I went out, we were there for an hour driving in and out. And it came right in front of the car. There was no doubt. It was like they wanted me to see it because it was not a light in the sky. It was an object right in front of the car, down low, bobbing, pulsing. I, I just like fell off the edge of the earth. And the second night I was really close. It came right at me the second night with all these people yelling and screaming and swearing and, and jumping up and down and applauding. Almost like when, when you see the, 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 I don't know if you've seen uh, the eclipses, but I remember I went to Oregon a couple of years ago and I saw an eclipse in the seventies. I went to Oregon to see the eclipse a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember it's the same thing. It was like a, this UFO sighting where as soon as the eclipse is over and the, the sun starts to come back up, everybody in this Oregon park stands up and starts to applaud and cheering. Oh, you and just, I were, you and I were there together. Uh, I remember that you were over, you were on Shasta. You were, you were on the mountain. I was, I was in the town of Shasta, whatever the, that town is. Um, yeah. in a, in an Airbnb, but I was watching your reports. You went out, you, you walked the trail. You were trying, well, no, we, to we, we, we left Shasta to go cause the, the Shasta didn't have the full eclipse. You had to go into Oregon. So we had gone in the middle of the night cause it, there was all this stuff about, oh, there's so many cars and you couldn't get a place and there was no hotel rooms. So we left in the middle of the night to drive into the, to the shadow in Oregon. We were at Shasta, but we left that yeah. morning to get into the shadow so we could see the full eclipse yeah, I remember and the full that. eclipse is people, people have no idea how exhilarating it is and how thrilled people standing there and applauding the universe. It's like, ah, cheering. It's just, well, just where amazing. we were at, at Shasta, uh, we still got, I think we got like 90%. Yeah. 
Yeah. But um, that was bizarre. You know what was bizarre about the eclipse? I'm going to stay on UFOs. But the, the eerie thing about it, I can't wait for a, another eclipse to go through this because now I know what to expect is how cold it got yeah, and yeah, how quiet exactly. it got. Yeah. And it happened quick. Drops, yeah. And and dark as, dark as can dark, be. And dark, really dark. Cold, that's what I noticed. Is like, wow, it was just bizarre. It's just, it's really a thrilling thing. It's a he, thrilling thing to go through. And can you imagine, uh, you know, go back like 2,000 years when you don't even know what's going on and that crap happens? Right. Yeah. To, to, oh, man. And, and that's what the UFO sighting was like. Because I remember there was 27 people. What had happened was everybody from the city, the big city was out there trying to see this thing. And then you had the kids with beer in the, on the roads. They have all mm -hmm. these side roads and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so there was 27 people on the middle of this road in the middle of nowhere that had all gathered together. And by the time that... It came. My friends all said, "No, nah, we're going back to Winnipeg. We're we're hungry. We're going back." And I said, "No, no, you got to see this. Stay, stay." And they all took off on me. And I remember the the car beside us. The girl couldn't see it. It because it was jumping around the sky. It was this flashing thing. It was in field of vision. It was jumping all over the sky. And 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 everybody was going, "Oh, the cow!" And this guy had a he had a Nikon camera, just as Nikon. They had brought out the, the motor drives. Remember how they moved the film with the uh -huh. motor drives? Yeah. And I remember this guy. All I could hear was this guy with the camera going click, zzz, click. And he was unloading the camera as this thing was coming. And this girl's going, I can't see it. She's crying. I can't see it. Someone show it to me. And everybody's ignoring her. And they're screaming and yelling. It was just like, just unbelievable. Now, and that's this where, was, this where was people all... dragged down the rabbit hole. You, you can't let that go when you see something like that. No, you can't. You can't. And all of this was in Carmen, right? Yeah. The and... first ones were in Carmen. The one with the, the triangle was... Uh, about uh, 11 miles away from there because it had seemed to have moved 11 miles the, in 1976, but the objects changed. There was no longer Charlie Red Star. There was these triangles flying around. But and, I, had, I had, and I didn't realize until we started the triangle book that I'd actually had the triangle sighting. I'd completely forgotten about it. And it was, uh, it was one of the five times that I got really, really close. I was close five times in two years. Now, Carmen truly is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. You know, I've been to Winnipeg. Uh, I've been to Regina. Okay. Yeah. I have been to Regina. Not too many people. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of a big place now because they got oil there. So they, it's, yeah. kind of, it's not the place to me probably were there before. It's a little bit more <laughs> hip than it was before. They've actually had freeways. Winnipeg is the only major city in North America. I think it doesn't have freeways. We're 750,000 people and got no freeways. So, yeah, but I'm looking at Carmen here and it's small now. Yeah. I, I can yeah. imagine what it was like in 1976. Uh, but it's just surrounded by basically yeah, it's just farm. farmland. And that's that's why I was so amazed because what I was that's when I when when I saw it the second night and it was flying away and I said that may be an extraterrestrial from another planet. But then I'm going, what's it doing? Like it's not doing anything. And that's what always comes to when people have these UFO sightings. Like what was it doing? And they go, oh, it wasn't doing anything. It was just there. And and so I asked the the guy who ran the airport, who was Bob Demert, who actually got to talk to uh, James Irwin. We have that in the uh, in one of the latest, I have a video of him talking about it where James Irwin tells him about the UFO on the moon. And he was a guy that rebuilt old warplanes. He ran the airport there and he built a Japanese zero. He pulled it out of the jungle and rebuilt a Japanese zero. And, um, so when I went to him, I said, Bob, what, why were they here? Why did they come to Carmen? There's nothing here. I mean, it's like just farmland. And he said, you know why they're here? I said, no, Bob, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. He said, I told you why they were here. You know why they're here. I said, Bob. In 35 years, I have no idea why they came to Carmen. He said, I told you, it's the missile silos. And as soon as he said that, I knew, because we all knew there was these 300 missile silos in North Dakota. And if there was ever a, a, a war, it's not a L.A. it's going to get taken out or, or New York. It's us that's going to get taken out because the number one thing you got to do, the number one target of the Russian missiles is the missile fields. Unless you take out the, the North Dakota missile fields, you're not going to see what's going to happen. So that's the, the number one target is there. And I knew that every 10th uh, Russian missile is going to la land short on top of us. So we all knew that if there was a nuclear war, we're the first to go. So we all knew they were there. And when he said the nuclear missiles, I went, oh, yeah, the n nuclear missiles, because we'd all seen them. They're in these farm fields, you know, with the, the fan. And uh, and then I started looking into that whole aspect and did, a, I think, three hours of of the connection between nuclear missiles and uh, and UFOs. And it's way bigger than people think it is. It's it, there's unbelievable. when you start tying in all the stories, whether it's Rendlesham, Six Day War, Yom Kippur War, all those things, you'll see UFOs involved because they're all involved nuclear missiles. And th that's a big, big part of the UFO story is nuclear missiles.
Yeah, just if if you just go around North Dakota and pick up some spots in the middle of nowhere and kind of zoom in, you can see <laughs> they're everywhere, man. There's yeah. a, they're everywhere. There's many in every county. Uh, we need to uh, uh, take our break here, but uh, what do you think? Um, you know, eleven miles outside of Carmen. And you have this encounter flying backwards, by the way. Well, uh, we're calling it backwards because of yeah. the flat side. Um, what do you think that message was? I know you think it was free, but what's the message? What do you think that uh, was? Well, I, I, th- I think for me, it was it was just this um, dragging me into this and that something happened. That's uh, People always ask you do, you, do you think you're abducted? I said, no, I have no recollection. But if I was ever abducted, that was when it happened because it was this bizarre thing where it was there like this terrible fear, like unbelievable, this little, and it was the slightest move, just like a, like that. And boom, the fear was gone and the thing started to move away. So something happened and we didn't know, like uh, people don't realize Bud Hopkins didn't write missing time till the 1980s. So we didn't know anything about missing time. So there may have been missing time. There may have been some encounter there, whatever, but I don't recall it and I don't have any, but that was the most bizarre sighting in terms of, if I had been abducted, that's when it happened in that triangle thing above, above, because it was that weird thing. There was something happened there that changed from fear to nothing, this little movement. Uh, and it was, it was very bizarre, but again, I had forgotten about it until we did the triangle book and then I revisited it. And, uh, the, the message to me is always going to be the same thing that I think we're all sort of picked you and I we're all picked. We're all have agreed to play in this game. And, uh, cause the, the things that happened to me, we're not accident. I look, I look back and I realize that all these things, uh, there were so many synchronicities. It was like, I was intended to do this and this is my role. And that's the way I look at it. The, uh, the other part, uh, to this, it appeared, uh, from the South, right. From North Dakota. Did it, yeah. when it flew back, did it head back? Did it head South? Did no, it head back to no, it towards was, the United it came, States? It made this, it was going along the U S border. And I was looking out of the corner of my eye. Cause I was so scared. It was on the U S border. It was going along the U S border. And that's why I said, don't turn, don't turn. And it started to make the turn. Cause we were North and it started to come towards the road. And I said, no, no, don't turn. And then I, it started to turn down the road. And that's when it turned into the triangle. It was this brilliant arc welding light thing. And as it turned on the tri on the road, then suddenly it was this low on the above the ground, maybe a couple of hundred feet or whatever. And I could see it was a triangle. It was coming directly at the car. And that's when I just panicked and I said, give me my binoculars. And it was right above the car. I was looking straight up at this thing and it was the entire field of vision. And I would, I thought these lights were five or 10 feet across and I couldn't tell whether it was lights on a craft or whether it was three objects, but I think it was lights on a craft. So when this kid in the back seat said, Oh, I saw the gun metal. It was, it was gray gun metal. And I go metal. You saw metal. And he said, yeah, yeah. And there was blue lights on it. And I went, there was no, blue. I didn't say to him, but, but he saw something completely different, but he remembered the same thing. When I said, do you remember that sighting? He said, yeah, I remember that sighting. Ever remembered. It was just like dramatic sighting. And then it moved away from the New York kids. It came over us. And then it moved towards this microwave tower, which was always, in, was involved in a couple of sightings. So what direction towards this microwave tower? Yeah. What direction would that have been? North, Northeast from where I was. So it was still, uh, it was traveling Northeast. So let's take our break. Yeah, I was going right. to the town of Brunkhild. If you're looking on a map, it was heading towards the Brunkhild microwave tower. So we were uh, at Sperling is where we had seen the object that was heading towards. Uh, I've, I've got the whole, ma- oh, there it is. Okay. I got you. We'll be right back. Our guest tonight, 1500 shows, Grant Cameron. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. here we listen to jimmy church you're listening to fade to black always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk jimmy church with fade to black kgra radio.com fade or not 
When you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Grant Cameron. I'm going to say it again. Tonight is our 1500th show. Celebrating with Grant. And uh, uh, Grant, you, you brought up you brought up a point earlier that we don't hear about landings and crash retrievals now like we used to. But uh, the recent budget uh, for uh, the the intelligence budget um, has uh, the provisions in there for a new uh, UAP task force. I don't know what the name of the new permanent uh, task force is going to be called. But in the terminology uh, here, there are five points that are made. And one of them... Uh, I could read the exact verbiage, but, um, and it's, uh, number three and number three states, I'm going to paraphrase that any debris retrieved from a crashed UAP needs to be collected and reported. Now that's, that's pretty interesting. And the the necessity of putting that into the budget, right? And 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 have the terminology there, which is not playing around. It's a very uh, direct uh, statement, and and this effectively becomes law. By the way, um, and uh, they they needed to put that in there. Why? Because there have been reports of crash retrievals and and or or word of them but it's not reported it's not discussed and nobody knows where this debris goes and 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 what's done with it well now they want to know and now it's part of this report so we may not have known publicly about crash retrievals and and debris 
but it appears to me that it's been going on and and now uh, they want to know and they want reports filed. Don't you find that interesting? Yeah, well, what they're trying to do, I think, is they're trying, it's the old idea of the black budget where you have uh, people hiding stuff from other departments. So they're trying to centralize it so that everybody has to report rather than, oh, you just said UFO sightings and able to hide stuff. So they're trying to get that because that, that's what I think it's all about. It's gone from um, uh, exploration to exploitation. So this is not about trying to figure out what UFOs is about. This is about technology. This is about military technology. Uh, for example, I, I'll state that th they're not really going to look at um, uh, experiencer stuff because there's this Title 10 thing. You, you can't deal with civilians. So basically what this is is to try to get the material. But the problem with the material is that they can get it all together. Uh, and I, I, I did an interview with Jacques Vallée. I asked him about this is this idea that uh, a lot of people have reported that they have all this technology or the, all this material. They may even have an intact craft and they can't turn it on, is the idea that they're, they're trying to gather it all together. But e even then, I, I asked Jacques Vallée, I said, Jacques, isn't this kind of strange where, you know, uh, Bigelow talked about the fact that, yeah, there was Roswell, but there was also one in China and there was one in Russia and there was one in South America and they're seeding these things. And then I said to Jacques, like, yeah, and then these metal pieces are falling all over the place. And doesn't doesn't it seem kind of strange, Jacques, that these these flying saucers come across the galaxy and then little pieces start to fall off them? And I said, don't doesn't that look more like gifting? And then Jacques says, I think I came up with that idea. And that's what you what they're what they're doing is they're trying to gather all the material because because what what I think has happened is uh, before World War II, the way that stuff worked was you had research budgets where people were trying to figure out uh, the nature of the dual slit experiment and consciousness and all this kind of stuff. And then what happened in World War II was that when they went to war, instead of sending scientists to war with guns, they made them what were called dollar a year men, where they would work for the military and work on inventions. And that's where in World War II they came up with 200 different inventions, the proximity fuse, the atomic bomb, uh, jet engines, um, plastic explosives, uh, synthetic rubber, nylon, all this kind of stuff. And they realized that this actually works very good. That what you do is, so you do the shut up and calculate and you gather the material and you try to get the technology. So that, I think what the, 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 the program that's being run is just going to be based on technology. It's going to be on back engineering, this kind of stuff. Uh, and it wouldn't, that's the thing is you, you need to get control of it so that some agency isn't hiding the material they're trying to collect it all in, in one sort of area because that's the problem that you have. That's what they claim for 9-11 was the reason 9-11 happened is because the, none of the agencies were talking to each other and you have this breakdown in communication. So they're trying to gather everything together. I still don't think they're going to uh, be able to solve the problem. I still think this stuff is beyond uh, the technology that they have and that you can have all the hardware you want. And I, I, I don't think they're going to really be able to... Uh, to back engineer, they they say they they will, but um, I think it. Even Jim Semivan said, I don't think I'll I'll live long enough to see uh, the end result of this whole thing of of doing it because it's like uh, you know the idea of getting a cell phone 200 years ago and and trying to back engineer it that uh, you have the hardware and you even have triangles and hardware. If you know the Tyler D story, uh, the material where he was at the gifting field in New Mexico, one of the pieces that uh, I got the photographs of one of the pieces that he recovered there, and it has a triangle and a circle inside the triangle. So these triangle things appear all over the place, they appear on people's bodies, and they even appear on hardware, which again sort of indicates is like this hint from whoever is behind this technology that here's another triangle, and they're, they're putting it out there. Well, there is, uh, okay, I have, um, I have the, the actual five pages in front of me. Yeah. And uh, the the other uh, let me let me let me pull this up directly. I want to uh, read this to you um, uh, to, 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 to there was this um, uh, to, 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 okay, here we go. Um, and, and this, um, and, and I just think of, uh, uh, John Burroughs, uh, yeah. uh, about this, um, uh, uh, 
Uh, point number four is evaluating links between unidentified aerial phenomena and adversarial foreign governments, other foreign governments, or non-state actors. Um, number six, evaluating the threat that such incidents uh, present to the United States. Number six, coordinating with other departments and agencies of the federal government as appropriate coordinating with allies and partners of the United States as appropriate to better assess the nature and extent of unidentified aerial phenomena. Um, and then it uh, speaks about uh, the, the effects. And um, I, I just, I, I don't understand unless they know, and it goes back to like the Condon report, um, and which is this um first off it says the the term unidentified aerial phenomenon means airborne objects witnessed by a pilot or air crew member that are not immediately identifiable yeah. and and then it, it uh, number j an assessment of any health-related effects for individuals that have encountered unidentified aerial phenomena. Yeah. Now, again, you know, just like uh, the the crash retrieval part, um, what what they, they put this in here for a reason. There must yeah, they did the be. Study. Kit Green and Nolan were doing the study on. They had the, the military people. And that's why I'm saying this has got to do with military. This is not civilian because mm -hmm. they can't they can't access civilians. They're not mm -hmm. allowed to. And that's why the skin the Skinwalker Ranch thing is not part of this. And experiencer stuff won't be part of it. But the, the they they got the reports from the military people who were within 500 yards of the object. And they had they talk. If you saw that leaked photograph that supposedly put off had with the uh, sort of the brain uh, thing and and Kit Green is talking about people live for five weeks or whatever and it's this idea that if you're in close to a UFO it can be deadly to your health which I point out I was within 500 yards five times and I was completely all right so Burroughs brings out the fact that he was injured at um, at at uh, Rendlesham Forest but there's the story that I asked and nobody really can confirm it and that was the fact that when that thing flared up when, when they got in close, Burroughs pulled his gun because 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 Kabanzak was there and and Burroughs was uh, or Peniston was even closer to the UFO. So why would and Peniston touch the UFO? So if it's if it's uh, across the board, what I would say that that if you're carrying a gun like the, the guys at Skinwalker Ranch, when they got this message, leave, you are not welcome. These special forces guys that were armed. And that's what Bigelow said. Those are or George Knapp said those that were had the worst effects. No, those that tr no, those that were the most aggressive to the phenomena had the worst effects at Skinwalker Ranch, and it's this idea that you're that you help manifest what's happening. So if you go in there all guns blazing and I'm going to take this thing on, you can be injured because I was close five times. The one time I tell you, Jimmy, I was so close I was going to jump on the thing. I was that close. I figured I could run and I could touch this thing before it took off. I was that close. I had no injuries, and yet. You take this thing where um, uh, Peniston said he was offered uh, full disability from Kit Green, and it's in his book. He was offered full disability and um, in exchange for the blood and the DNA because they're checking these these military people to see injuries and that kind of stuff. And he said, I wasn't injured. I, I don't need your money. He just basically turned it down. He said, no, I'm not giving it to you. I never got injured. And I'm so that's the whole thing. Why was why was John Burroughs injured and Kabanzak and Peniston weren't injured? And the only thing was the story I heard was that John pulled his gun. John said we didn't take the guns out. He doesn't think that happened. But there's that that aspect of uh, why do some people get injured and some people don't? Because a lot of people are very close to crafts uh, and don't get injured. But there's a study that was done. I think Kit Green had 110 people, and that's when they're looking at the the putamen, the caudate putamen, and the psychic thing in the brain, and that sort of thing. And they're looking at these injuries. And that was the study that I mentioned last time I was on your show. That was finance. That Bigelow was contractor to that as well. When when Peniston said to him, "So what are you doing? Why are you looking at experiences? Why you why do you want my DNA? What well, I'm going to find out what's going on. You're not getting out of here. You're going to tell me what's going on." Mm -hmm. And he said, "Oh, we're doing this study." And he said, are you working for the Defense Department? And he said, well, yeah. He said, there's eight people. And are you working for Bigelow? Yeah, Bigelow. So Bigelow was running.
running it. And what they were looking at was experiencers. And that's this whole thing about the DNA and the the the, F, the fMRI. That's what they wanted. And a lot of people, apparently Whitley Strieber gave it, uh, Chris Bledsoe. I heard these rumor stories that they were going after all these people to, to see, does the DNA change? And that's when they're looking at And that was a study that was done that that was mentioned in Penniston's book. So where did that study go? Uh, what was the results of that study? And this was looking at the effects uh, because you can use it for your own thing. If you can, if you can find out what the effect is on our troops, then you can use it against the Russians or the Chinese. It's, it's, it becomes a weapon. And that's that slide nine, the, the famous slide nine. If you look at all the stuff on slide nine, that's all Skinwalker Ranch. That was from Skinwalker Ranch. How do you put bulls inside the trailers? How do you rip off the cords from the, the camera that's watching the other camera? How, how do you uh, get into people's heads when the, 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 the guys with the, they were told to leave the ranch? The, this thing was put into their head. And then when they went home and these wine bottles are flying around the, the room and smashing on the walls, that's the kind of stuff they're looking at because that's the DIA. You want to figure out not so much how does UFOs work, how does reality work? How do they put bulls inside trailers? If you can figure that out, you understand reality and you can use this as all military technology. You can develop this kind of stuff. So I think that's what they're looking at. There's a study that was done on injuries to people that were close to UFOs, but I would maintain they all have to be military people because they couldn't get the records of, of civilians. They would have had, Kit Green would have had access to the military me medical records of people. And I think at one point he had 110 people or something like that, that he'd looked at. And that's when, when Penniston said to him, how many are still alive? And he said, just you and Burroughs. Now, if we look at subparagraph A, which kind of goes, uh, touches upon what you're referring to here. Subparagraph A says, and, and get ready for this, Grant, chew on this. Yeah. <laughs> An update on any efforts underway. Okay, let me repeat that. An update on any efforts underway on the ability to capture or exploit discovered unidentified aerial phenomena. Yeah. Now, again, <laughs> they, they're clearly saying that these efforts are underway right now. Right. And, and, and yeah. we need to know what's going on. And the word exploit, exploit discovered unidentified aerial phenomena. Yeah. This is in the budget, Grant. Yeah. But this is technology. This is how it worked. That's what I said in World War Two. That's where they learned that in World War Two, if you put all the scientists and get them to all work together and get their heads together, you come up with all these massive inventions. So at the end of the war, they didn't shut it down. It was called the Joint Research and Development Board. They kept it going, and they would still bring in these people, these high high level guys, because because sci uh, the a lot of uh, guys like the Jason Group was a, a group of high level physicists that they would pull during the summer because they don't teach for five months. So during the summer, they would give them these little courses and they would give them nuclear weapon problems and stuff like that. So they're just trying to access all this material and it's all to exploit this thing for military technology. So it's not, it's not a civilian thing. It's not to, and, and the way it works is they, I think what their idea is you use it first for military technology. And then when you develop radar, then we'll move it into the civilian area, but right. military gets it first. Right, 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 right. And uh, paragraphs E, F, G, uh, and H all speak about that. E says, identification of potential aerospace or other threats posed by unidentified aerial phenomena to the national security of the United States. Right? F, yep. an assessment of any activity regarding unidentified aerial phenomena that can be attributed to one or more adversarial foreign governments. Yeah. That's plural. G, identification of any incidents or patterns regarding unidentified aerial phenomena that indicate a potential adversarial foreign government may have achieved a breakthrough in aerospace technology. Yeah. And uh, and then they follow that up with H. It all flows together. An update on the coordination by the United States with allies and partners on efforts to track, understand, and address unidentified aerial phenomena. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. So they're, they're just pulling all the agencies together because uh, you, you heard that Tom DeLong, I think he even mentioned that in 2016 interview about the stove piping. And Hal Putoff has mentioned that. 
that you or Jacques Vallée mentions that you give a, one piece to this company, you give one piece to this company, but nobody's talking to each other. So it's all stovepipe and nobody's in the black world. And I think that's what they tried to do is move this into the white world where you can get this cooperation and people talking to each other rather than everybody trying to hide the, the evidence uh, for themselves. Find out what the your adversaries are doing and, and the potential threat that they may have if they've got because we know the Russians are working on Chinese. Everybody knows nobody's stupid. They know what the potential is. If you can put put four bulls inside a locked trailer, I mean everybody's looking at that. The Russians and the Chinese and they're all trying to figure out how does this work. And if you can figure out how it works, that's technology that you can use. So uh, Lou came on the show um, on Thursday. Or no, on Wednesday, uh, before Kevin Day, I'm sure uh, that you listened to uh, what Monday. Lou had. Monday. Or Monday. It, it yeah. was this week. Man, it's all blurring together. <laughs> but but we got to show 1500 grand. That's all that there matters. You go. That's, all, that's all that matters. Is, uh, yeah, that's right. That was on Monday. Okay. Is this uh, about the task force, the UAPDF as we know it now, is going to be dissolved and a new permanent... Uh, UAP, UA, UFO investigative body, a clearinghouse, a central place for all of this would be permanently established. And here is the wording of that so everybody can understand uh, not only what Lou mentioned, but what we are talking about. Task force, not later than the date on which the secretary establishes the office under subsection A, the secretary shall terminate the unidentified aerial phenomenon task force under these definitions. One, the term appropriate congressional committees means the following. The Committee on Armed Forces, the Committee on Foreign Affairs, and the, and the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence of the House of Representatives, the Committee on Armed Forces, uh, Armed Services, the Committee on Foreign Relations and the Select Committee of, on Intelligence in the Senate, the term unidentified aerial phenomena means airborne objects witnessed by a pilot or air crew member that are not immediately identifiable. Requirement, not later than December 31st, 2022, and annually thereafter until December 31st, 2026, the Secretary of Defense shall submit to the appropriate congressional committees a report on unidentified aerial phenomena. Two elements. Each report under paragraph one shall include, with respect to the year covered by the report, the following information. A. An analysis of data and intelligence received through reports of unidentified aerial phenomena. B. An analysis of data relating to unidentified aerial phenomena collected through one, geospatial intelligence, two, signals intelligence, three, human intelligence, and four, measurement and signals intelligence. C, the number of reported incidents of unidentified aerial phenomena over restricted airspace in the United States. D, an analysis of such incidents identified under subparagraph C. The mission currently performed by the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force as of the date of the enactment in this act, the duties of the office established under the subsection shall include the following. One, developing procedures to synchronize and standardize the collection, reporting, and analysis of incidents regarding unidentified aerial phenomena across the Department of Defense. Yeah. Two, developing processes and procedures to ensure that such incidents from each military department are reported and incorporated in a centralized repository. Three, Establishing procedures to require the timely and consistent reporting of such events, uh, uh, such incidents. Four, evaluating links between unidentified area phenomena and adversarial foreign governments, other foreign governments, and non-state actors. Um, uh, establishing these incidents present in the United States. Coordinating with all departments of the federal government as appropriate. And, uh, and then, again, following up, they mentioned this now four times in, in this, coordinating with our allies and partners of the United States uh, to what the extent and nature 
of unidentified aerial phenomenon. And, uh, and there it goes. Now, it says here that the establishment... Uh, establishment of office to address unidentified aerial phenomena shall not be later than 180 days after the date of the enactment of this act. The Secretary of Defense, in coordination with the Director of National Intelligence, shall establish an office within the office of the Secretary of Defense to carry out a departmental wide basis. So there it is. And okay, I don't think question it, for you. Yes. Okay. Uh, the Canadian, I'm, I, we just did a final edit today on a book on the Canadian government uh, situation in the 1950s. Wilbur Smith wrote a top secret memo in November of 1950s said he was told by American officials, flying saucers exist. It's the most highly classified subject in the United States. So my question would be uh, the first report that came out was 400 pages. There was six pages with anything on them uh, that was unclassified. How much of this is going to be? That was 1.5 percent of the report was unclassified. How much of this is going to be classified, and how much is the public going to learn about? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, that's the question that we all have. Um, now, I was told directly. Um, uh, I can't say from who, but it was not from somebody that we know of the UFO community. Okay, so I, I'll say that, but I can't say who. But I was told uh, in writing, um, it was uh, 88 pages, the classified version. And uh, the first one you're saying? The first the, 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 the June 25th report, 88 pages, not 400. And I know that uh, Daniel Sheehan, uh, you know, stated 400 pages. 400, yeah. Um, and I understand why he said that. And he represents Lou. And so you would think that. Daniel, but I, I don't think Daniel was told that. I think that he uh, did a general assessment looking at 144 cases that that classified version of the report must have been around 400 pages. But uh, I was told directly uh, a completely different number. That, that that's, the, that's the part that, that sort of makes me wonder is if we can't even find out how many pages there are, how, we, how much we're going to learn what's in it, if we can't even figure out how many pages are in the report. I mean, that, even if that's under the classification or unknown or whatever, it's just sort of uh, how much of this is going to spin out. Does it say in, the, does it say in these five pages, uh, it does it mention classified, unclassified? Uh, no, it does I, not. I would think that this is going to be still black ops, need to know, code right. word, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, what it, the only mentions in here is that the report would come in annually on December 31st at the end of each year. Um, it does say that. And the only other clear dating on this is what I just read to you. Now, this is passed. <clears throat> okay, so the budget is in. Um, so it's 180 days. Uh, today is, what is, what's, what, are we, we're the on. Six. The 6th. The 6th. Today is Wednesday. I think this got passed on Monday, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll check into that. So it would be 180 days, you know, from this week, uh, that the new, uh, group, which has not been named. Right. And I just find that interesting because it says here establishment, and this is a, this is line number 21, um, not later than, not later than 180 days after the date of the enactment of this act. Okay. So I believe that this has been signed off, that the budget has gone through. I will clarify that, and I, I, I have the ability to do that. Um, and I'll get back to everybody tomorrow night. But if that's the case, six months from today, uh, we sh or it, at least uh, it could be, it says not later than, so it could be before, that we're going to have a name of this new group. And it, I don't think it's going to be called the UAP task force anymore. It's going to be under another name and we're going to have to go and chase that down and figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have the date of December, 2022, wasn't it? Was yep. It? Yep. And, and what is that? What is that where he's got to report? The... Yeah. Okay. I'll pull that up. I've got to take a break. I'll pull that up and we'll discuss that when we come back. And also when we come back after this short break, uh, Grant is going to be hanging out with me and a bunch of other really cool people in Laughlin, Nevada, November 12th through the 14th. I want to know I want to know what Grant's going to be talking about. I get to hang out and break bread with Grant Cameron. 
We'll discuss all of that when we come back after this short break. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Why is it we're not very good with our health regiment? until it's too late. We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. So do your body a favor. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, does anybody call money dough anymore? Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So log on to GetTheTea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's GetTheTea.com. Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. When you're in the house for longer periods of time, you can see them flying or running across the floor. Ooh, yuck. They're unhealthy, gross, and disgusting. Bugs. I loathe bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. On contact, it kills hidden bugs, including ants, roaches, and fleas. Plus, Orange Guard is a residual repellent. All of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally recognized as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard, available at orangeguard.com, Whole Foods, and Ace Hardware. Gold loves chaos, uncertainty, and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market? We can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure. United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Grant Cameron, our 1500th show. And, uh, and, and let me just say this. I love Canada. I've spent way too much time up there. 
And uh, uh, the chat room, uh, Grant, is, is, uh, is all about Regina. And, <laughs> and, and, and see, this is the thing. Um, Regina knows what the name of their town is, city, I should say. And, uh, and it's a great place. But I, I, uh, I, when I, you try to crack the Regina joke in Regina, and I, <laughs> I remember, uh, 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 well, anyway, it doesn't matter who it was. Um, but I said, I, said <laughs> I go, Regina rhymes with, and I smiled, <laughs> and he goes, man, you think you're planting a flag? I said, uh, you know, and he, we've we've heard it all, and it's just so funny. <laughs> they've they, they, they've probably heard that joke a hundred times, a <laughs> hundred times, if not a thousand. Um, but uh, it, I love it is a time. big football place. I mean, it's they they got the green jerseys and they wear watermelons on their head. It's like it's almost like Green Bay. It's one of those kind of places where they they take their football pretty serious. There's nobody, there's no empty seats and they're just like crazy. And they, they travel around with their team all over Canada. It's a, it's quite a, quite a place. Yeah. I, I remember. Uh, so uh, we pulled in a uh, small airport. Uh, we had a private, private plane and we land. And, and so we pull into town and we're pulling up to this hotel and I'm looking at it. I'm like, man, this looks like a castle. Right. And I'm just looking at it. <laughs> And the person that I'm with who's uh, from the area says, this used to be uh, the government center building. Yeah. Like, you know, the parliament of, of, of what, uh, uh, oh, that makes sense. You should have seen my room. <laughs> oh my, uh, it was, uh, it was cool. It was, I, I love that town. I love Regina. Great food too. Great beef. Um, oh, okay. So uh, back, to, you asked me uh, before the break, uh, about uh, uh, the requirements of delivery of reports and the dates. Uh, and this is what it says. It says, not later than December 31st, 2022, and annually thereafter until December 31st, 2026, the Secretary of Defense shall submit to the appropriate congressional committees a report on unidentified aerial phenomena. So it doesn't say every 90 days, doesn't say yeah. every 180 days. It says annually, once a year. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's it. I know it's kind of a bummer uh, for everybody uh, to think about this happening happening annually, uh, but that's never happened before, first off. But the other part is they have to establish, and, and they're definitely pointing everything out, they have to establish uh, channels of communication, yeah. uh, interagency, and between the branches of the military. When I say interagency, the the, the intelligence communities, um, they've got to get these communications uh, established, and and that's not an easy feat. Uh, we struggled with it after nine eleven, and. That's probably why 9-11 happened was the lack of communication with everybody in the government because they want to uh, keep that data collection to themselves. And yeah. you've just pointed that out, Grant, and that's the way it's always been. And with the UFO phenomenon, it certainly has been the way things have been established. Yeah, that was one of the rumors I heard was the the whole idea why, you know, Lazar, you always hear this thing, the Navy, the Navy, the Navy, and all the reports coming off. Why is the Navy? Why not the Air Force? And one of the things that that if you understand this funding thing, when the UFO thing started, the Air Force hadn't been developed yet. They, they hadn't been designed yet. So the Navy had all the research funds in the de de Department of Defense in 1946. And so when the Air Force comes along and then suddenly says, oh, we're going to take over the UFOs and all the money and stuff, they go, no, 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 we're, we're still running this thing. This is, and that's, you always have these inter uh, agencies rivalries is, you know, Navy's got its own Air Force and the, you know, the Army and you got all these things where nobody wants to give something up to somebody else just because you're the new guy on town. We've got the money and it's all about uh, research funding and we're not giving up the funding. So that was one of the stories why the Navy was so heavily involved because the Navy was the only game in town when the UFO thing started. Now, do you think uh, they keep talking about allies? Well, you know, we have Canada, uh, probably, yeah. uh, well, our closest neighbor, uh, certainly. But uh, without a doubt, uh, a, a real true ally 
of the United States. And do you expect uh, open communication between the two governments on this? Everything that's happening with UFOs down in the United States certainly goes on in Canada. I, I've, already, I've filed what's called a, an access to information request here uh, with the uh, embassy. With uh, um, I understand the embassy has been talked to. There was uh, official meetings taking place. So I'm trying to track that down. It's already happened. And and what are you referring to? Uh, communication with the United States on the UAP situation. Uh, even Lula Alzando said the five uh, uh, eyes have been informed. And uh, my word is that uh, we know what the ambassador, at least one uh, U.S. ambassador to the United States was uh, given an official meeting, and I'm trying to track it down with the uh, with the paperwork to mm-hmm. confirm. And I know that there are um, the, the, uh, people in the government in the opposition party that have studied this. I was brought in on a briefing thing to bring them up to speed because they don't know who everybody is. Uh, they've had discussions, not formal discussions. So there's been a there's been people who have been talked to in Canada already. Now uh, I would assume that there has always been a pretty consistent sharing of information on all levels for any reason between uh, the two countries. But then I have to go back and I have to look at the reality of it. Canada is still pretty pissed off about Wayne Gretzky. So, (laughs) Yeah, take take it seriously. It was done, I think, um, all along. What, What people have to realize is that during World War II, and this is where all this hinges World War II, this technology thing. That's when everybody learned how to do technology. Right. And the the Americans, the British, and the Canadians all worked on the atomic bomb. They all worked on radar. They were all working together and worked as one thing. So Tizard was the big guy in 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 England. Uh, Oman Salant, who, if you see the Canadian UFO top secret memo, Salant is the guy mentioned in Canada. Right. And in the United States, it was Vannevar Bush. So Wilbur Smith, and this is in this book that I'm just about to release, Wilbur Smith actually sent a a paper on UFO propulsion to Vannevar Bush. Now, we don't know what happened, but we know that it went to Vannevar Bush because we actually have the letter from the Canadian Embassy that describes the fact. So there was a lot of cooperation, and one of the things they were cooperating on is that the Americans had told, this is one of the things I got into the consciousness thing. The, in, in the top secret memo, it says the four things. You, flying saucers exist. It's the most highly classified subject in the United States. It's of tremendous significance to the Americans. There's a group, a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush who are trying to figure it out. And the very next line says, we were also told by American officials that other things might be associated with the flying saucers. And this is 1950, such as mental phenomena. And the Americans aren't doing very well because they said, if we are working on it, they're willing to exchange credentials and talk to us. If we're working on mental phenomena, they're willing to talk to us. So there was these cooperations going back and forth, trying to work on this in the early days on the on the UFO thing. And then the Canadians shut the program down in 1954. And um, I don't know what happened after that. It sort of went in. But now it sounds like... Um, We've got some leads as to who's in contact, and we have the access to information request where we can actually, we may not be able to find out what the briefing was or what they were told, but we can actually confirm that there was a meeting that took place with the Canadian ambassador to the United States. Now, what is, uh, what's the overall uh, mood? How does, how does Canada, in a general sense, look to their neighbors to the south? You know, it, overall, uh, it, is it is it a big brother thing? Is it is there uh, some drama that may may be there? I mean, how is the outlook uh, uh, about about the United States? Well, it, it used to, I think it was a, a lot better than before than it was now. Now you have this thing. For example, the American border is still shut, right? Because you're you're shutting this the southern border. So um, Canada, the United States has allowed China in, uh, India to fly in, uh, and Canada, the border's still shut. It's still sh- sealed down. So Americans can come into Canada, but Canada can't go into the United States. The border is, is closed. So it's things like that and, and the uncertainty in the United States, that kind of stuff, you know, that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not what it was before. It's a lot more, we're not as political as, as what's going on in the United States. So. But it used to be like, for example, everybody in Canada lives within, you know, 60 miles of the border. So everybody's got American TV. Everybody's, you know, it's it's you'd never know 
uh, that you were not in the United States. It was that close. But now that you have these and, and then the trade dispute with the, the cars and stuff like that. So there's there's some some stuff, but people still like to go to the United States. People like to it, it's not as good as it used to be. It used to be really cheap to shop in the United States. People don't do that. But you have a lot of snowbirds go down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's still a pretty close uh, relationship in terms of basically you would not know if you were in in uh Canada that you were not in the United States. It's pretty, the TV is all the same. It's all pretty much the same. Now, uh, and what about the media coverage? And because I think that's a really good point where, you know, if every, most Canadian citizens live that close to the border and they're getting uh, American television, then they're getting American news and they're also yeah. getting the UAP coverage and, you know, Nick Pope and Lou Elizondo and Tucker Carlson. Is that same coverage happening in Canada when it comes to UFOs and UAPs? U- UFOs in Canada has never caught on. That's always something I've noticed in the United States. Like you have all these conferences, especially in California. Like every city's got a conference, big, you know, yeah, and big ones like, like uh, you know, the uh, Alien Con and uh, Conscious and Life Expo, like thousands of people. There is no conference in Canada. There's one in Toronto that ran a couple of years ago. There are no conferences in Canada. The UFO community, there really is none. There's a couple of researchers around. There are like little tiny groups. There is no UFO mentality here at all, I don't think, in terms of people talking about it or groups or big conferences and stuff like that. It's, isn't that fascinating where the two, the two leading researchers uh, in ufology, yourself and Stanton Friedman, are both Canadian? Yeah, and Chris Rakowski is the, yeah, we've Chris. now had the story that broke yeah. uh, in Canada. Like you had Bill Moore getting documents from the government. Now the Canadian government has admitted that they were sending, do- and I knew Chris was getting these documents back in the 1990s because uh, I worked at the university, worked at the university with me. So I knew about this, and now they've admitted that they're, they were feeding documents. So the question is, are these documents legitimate? Uh, why were they feeding documents to him? But the government did say what I believe is the same thing with the U.S., is the government basically said, we don't believe it's a threat. We don't know what's going on. We're really not interested. And that's the problem that the Americans have had the same thing, is it's not in anybody's um, job jar in terms of uh, nobody really took it. Now you're moving it into an agency where everybody has to report. Uh, this is important. We want you to do this. But in Canada, they were sending these reports because I don't. I firmly believe that like 99.9999999% of people have no clue in the government about UFOs and they don't care because you're busy in communications or in transport or whatever. It's not my job. I don't really care. I mean, who cares, you know, and that's the thing. They really don't believe it. So that's why they were sending these reports down. There may be one or two people, but you, you know how intelligence works. All you need is one guy in Canada to feed in the top material into an agency in the United States and the people above him don't even know he's doing it. So there's really, I don't think any interest. The only one we had was the story that Paul Hellyer told. And even Paul Hellyer, who was the deputy prime minister, is like the vice president of Canada. And when I asked him about his things, he said, I didn't know. He said, I was running the secretary of the, uh, the, uh, the defense department. I didn't know. I was trying to put the, all the agencies together. I, were, I saw reports, but I wasn't really interested in what was going on. And, and so he was asked in a, in a conference, uh, who, who in the Canadian government actually knows what's going on. And he, and you could tell he was guessing. He was going, uh, the head of the Privy Council, who's in the Prime Minister's office. And then it came around the second time, and that's when he told this dramatic story that I just well fell off my chair, where he said, oh, I know one guy who knows what's going on in Canada. And he said, I was contacted by a guy out of the Air Force who said, there's this guy who's got something he wants to get off his chest. And we, he wants to tell somebody, and you're the guy he's picked to tell the story. And it was the head of the emergency management. So in the United States, it's FEMA. And if you take a look, the FEMA is, runs the, the, the bunker where the president is taken if there's a nuclear war outside right. of Washington and stuff like that. Right. And that would make sense that the head of FEMA, the head of the emergency measures in Canada would know. Because if, if there's a crash and you can't control the story, you may have the stock market meltdown. You could put money in the banks. You have to have a, all these you know plans. And so he said that the, the, the guy, was, he wanted to tell him the story. And he didn't contact him. The Air Force guy phones him back and he said, the guy had Lou Gehrig's Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, ALS. And he said, he's about to go off the cliff. You better phone him. So he phoned up the guy and he said, I just want to let you know, I know it's for real. I was taken to the CIA. I signed my life away. I was told this is for real. I got a briefing and I actually sat inside a craft in his, inside Area 51. I just want to let you know, 
this story's for real. And that was when I heard Paul Heller tell that story, that this guy in his deathbed had told him this story. That is one guy. But other than that, I, 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 that's why I really don't work on Canadian stuff. I haven't got a clue where to go. Now I hear about the Canadian ambassador to the United States. Was So now we have a lead. But until then, like in the United States, you know, the CIA is involved, DIA is involved. You know, all these agencies, people are leaking documents, they're running around. But in Canada, I haven't got a clue. I said, I haven't a clue who to go to. Well, who do you go to find out who's got the material? Well, so now we've got a couple leads. Well, Trudeau's a reptilian. <laughs> and, and, and so, and you've got that going for you. Um, has, has, he, he was given a briefing. Someone that provided was, some uh, briefing, yes, that's, reptilian briefing before, yeah, 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 and that yeah, yeah. destroyed everything. Some crazy <laughs> briefing about, you know, they're going to take over and all this kind of stuff. And, and I, I don't know if it got to him, but that's the kind of stuff that kills you is that somebody puts that kind of stuff in there and everybody just backs away and says, I don't want anything to do with this. Has so, he, has, has Trudeau ever mentioned or his dad, uh, have have they ever brought up uh, the UFO subject? You know, yeah. like you know, like Trump and 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 Clinton yeah. and and uh, Obama. They don't have uh, seem to have any issues with uh, with discussing it, at least mentioning it or answering questions about it. But anything with the Trudeaus and the family? No, the only the only prime ministers I heard was uh, Diefenbaker in the early '60s had to deal with it, and uh, Pearson, who won the Nobel Prize Peace Prize, actually made a speech about uh, how the world would unite if faced with the alien threat. That's where almost like Reagan got it from, and he talked about if we were invaded by Martians, the world would come together. That was in a speech that he gave, I think, at, at his uh, Nobel Prize winning speech. So that, he was prime minister in the '60s. Uh, and in, and Hellier may have been, been under his in the in his cabinet. And the other one that Wilbur Smith's wi uh, wife told me was that in the early days, Wilbur Smith was dealing directly with the prime minister of Canada and that they had decided to withhold the Project Magnet report and that the report sat on the prime minister's desk for three months. And and that there was a meeting. This, If you've heard this famous story I tell in the book about the Canadians open up Suffield, Alberta for a UFO to land. And the whole, we, we had this, and I put in the book, I have this correspondence going back and forth to Hellier. And we're telling Hellier in the 1970s, because in 1967, he made a speech at a UFO landing base, which is a centennial project or whatever, for right. some town or whatever. He said, oh, this isn't the first time we had a UFO landing base. The Canadians opened Suffield, Alberta, which was a top secret base for UFOs to land in 1954. UFO, nothing landed, therefore UFOs don't exist. And we were after him in the 1970s and saying, how did the UFOs know where to land? How did they know? They had to have gotten some communication. So I showed it to Wilbur Smith's wife and I said, was Wilbur behind this? And she said, yeah, Wilbur was behind it. He had a, an alien by the name of AFA and he told the Canadian government, if you don't shoot this, try to shoot this thing down, I'll get AFA to land. They opened up a Suffield, Alberta, and he could not get a guarantee that they would allow it to take off. The Canadian Parliament, the Royal Canadian Police went with it. The Defence Department went along with it, but the Cabinet would not give 100% agreement they would allow it to take off. Wilbur said, it's called off. There's no landing. That's what the, how the story happened. Wilbur Smith called it off, but they opened up Suffield, Alberta, where they'd done new, uh, nerve gas testing. It had a restricted, like Area 51, a restricted overflight right. on it and stuff like that in Alberta. But they actually, in 1950, opened, opened and that's, the remember, that's when the, 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 the famous Eisenhower uh, incident occurred at, at Edwards Air Force Base. It was the same year where the Canadians were going to land a UFO at Suffield, Alberta. Now, uh, and Hellier, I think Hellier mentions... Um, and you would be the one to know this. You can correct me. But I think Hellier mentions that he actually personally went to follow up many years later on the UFO landing bases and and got nowhere. It's like it it either it ended or nobody else is talking about it because I couldn't find anything out. Right. Didn't Hellier mention that? I, I don't remember that. He He got into some trouble because he had started his own party. So he started his own party. So he didn't have the connections inside the government that you would you would have if you were just a Republican or a Democrat. So he uh, where he started, but he really that's what people don't realize. Hellier did not know anything until his son came. He was reading the 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 day after Roswell by Corso, and his son-in-law he was at his ca his cabin north of Toronto, and his son-in-law came and said, "What are you reading that garbage for? That's absolute nonsense. Are you, are you stupid? Like, what are you reading that?" And he said, "Really? It's, it's this nonsense." And then his son was working for a two-star general and he asked the general and that's when the general said, oh, yeah, this is for real and more. And then that's when Hellier phoned the general 
and John Alexander tried to get the general's name. He never gave us the general's name, Air Force General. And the guy said, yeah, it's all real and more. That's when Hellier went off the deep end and he started chasing the story. But what he, what the mistake he made, he was just repeating whatever he was saying. He didn't have any true, true access to get to stuff, except for that guy, that, that, that emergency management guy that talked to him. But other than that, he was just sort of grabbing stories off the internet and, and repeating them. Mm-hmm. And it worked to our benefit because he was this former you know, high level government official that everybody, it sort of raised consciousness, but it was a bunch, he was putting out a bunch of stuff that he really didn't vet very well. I don't think. Do you think, um, uh, that the five eyes and, and when we look at the importance of the five eyes and, and who they are, do they have to establish the same protocol as the United States where Canada's got to go interagency and open communications between the agencies and centrally collect the data. And then that would come into the United States uh, to the repository and the same thing for Australia and the, you yeah. know, the rest of the five. I is, are these protocols uh, needed for, for each country? Do they have the same issues of well, no communication? I, I actually, it's a good thing you might brought it up because I'll file an access to information request as to what the protocols are, what they're, what they're doing. Because it would be defense, but you'd have the same sort of idea, where in Canada it's actually worse because you have uh, the deputy um, minister is actually the guy with the power. The minister is being moved around. They're juggling cabinet all the time, so they're always switching the head guy. It's the deputy uh, that would have all the power, but it's the same sort of power struggle where you're trying to figure out who's collecting UFO information. It's not centralized and nobody really cares. I think that's the main problem. Same in the United States is that the people who know what's going on are hiding in bunkers and they're not accessing and you need it coordinated where the the people who are supposed to be handling this stuff, like the secretary of defense is actually doing his job. That's I think what they're trying to do is, is get it back under control. Cause that was the whole thing with the Wilson leak. If you remember the Wilson leak, if the Wilson leak is right, if that is a legitimate document, that's bad news where you have these high level, you know, head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff doesn't know what's going on. And he tries to figure out what's going on. And they say, we'll pull a star. You back off or you're, you're not going to get promoted. That's what the whole deal is, is to get it back under control that it's government of the people for the people by the people. And it, it's it's gone to the, the contractors and, and people running or when even with uh, the story with Dick D'Amato, if you know the story, uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee, Byrd, was very interested in UFOs and he sends Dick D'Amato to Area 51. And that's when he goes to Jesse Marcel and he says he t- attaches the, 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 the book by Whitley Strieber, Majestic. And he said, I just want to let you know this stuff is true. There's a deep agency. There's people who have all the money and I'm just here to find out how much the security is costing. And he was furious and he's been furious to this day. Day. He still won't talk about it, but he knows that all this was being run off the books. And what well, I think what you're what you're trying to do here, whether it's Danny Sheehan or Elizondo, is get it back on the books so it's under control of the people who are paying for it through their taxes. I want to uh, do some overtime with you, Grant. You're okay. not you're, you're not going to bed. You thought you <laughs> okay. you thought you were getting off easy. It's our 1500th show, there so we've go. got to okay. have a 1500th overtime with Grant Cameron. Uh, too much too much to uh, follow up on. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and soon to be the UnX Network. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. 
The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device, or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com this is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. Wow, what a show tonight. 1,500 down. Tomorrow's 1,501. I don't have to mention this again for another two and a half years uh, until we get to 2,000. And our guest tonight celebrating with us is uh, Grant Cameron coming to us from the Great White North. And uh, now I wanted to ask you this, Grant, and 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 when we get into overtime, I, I like to loosen up a little bit and, 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 and kind of uh, go into another direction. Um, and, and not be so serious, but, but this is kind of a serious question. If we look at, uh, you brought up John Alexander tonight and, and, you know, Paul Hellyer is no longer with us, but if we, if we take a look at, um, some of the old timers who are now officially old timers, much older than you or I, uh, John Alexander, Hal put off kid green, Semi van uh, uh, and the rest. There's a whole long yeah. list of you know the Nids and the Bass crew and all of. That. They're not going to be with us uh, uh, forever, and this torch is now actively being passed, and and that's it. And we have a, n- a new generation that is is taking things over, like it happens with everything over the years, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, how influential uh, today do you think somebody like John Alexander or or put off or Kit Green or Semi Van um, uh, and you have a long list that you can add to to the um, how influential are they today? Probably not much, and and things are going to phase out and go into another direction very quickly, don't you think? Well, I think John Alexander may not be doing as much, but I think uh, Hal Putoff is still, it's the old thing. It's like it gets in your blood. You go down the rabbit hole. He's still trying to figure this out. I think he may be behind a lot of this uh, movement because if you know the the story that Alexander, this is my understanding, maybe not 100% accurate, but Alexander res- resigned in the morning and in the afternoon was the meeting with the New York Times. 
It was almost like it was planned. And in that meeting was Hal Putoff. In that meeting was uh, uh, Semivan. Uh, and um, there was a contractor. So I'm not really sure the contractor was, but there was a bunch of people. So I think Hal Putoff and people like that uh, work behind, but they all work in the, in the, um, in the, um, in their little, um, field, for example, like we mentioned Kit Green with this is this study that he's probably still doing this study with, with the injuries. So he's putting his little thing in there. They're all contractors, but I think they're all still very, very busy at trying to figure this thing out because they're not really doing it anymore for money. They're just trying to figure this thing out. And you have some people that are going to take over. You have like Eric Davis, who's probably the sharpest guy I've ever come across. I knew, knew him fairly well. 20 years ago, I dealt with him. Uh, very, very sharp guy. And you have this whole group that, again, it comes to the secrecy thing that, you know, the, the, they call it the Cosmic Club or the, um, the Invisible College with Diane Pasolka and all the people that are in there, Kripal and all those. There's a whole bunch of people in there, but we just don't know who they are. Uh, Tyler D., uh, is is not he's not a young guy, but he's uh, fairly active. I think a lot of these people we don't know them as much because they're more in the in the sort of the uh, staying in the in the background. Uh, whereas Hell put off and these guys were very open because they were doing the remote viewing program. But I would say that most of those people, uh, Jacques Vallée is in his 80s. He just put out another book. Uh, he's still pretty active. I don't think, and cause to them it's a game. And, and I, I had this before I, I talked about the, um, I think I was one of the first people to put up the name for the, for the Avery. And I actually sent to Ross, I sent a, um, uh, to show him, he was talking about why is the secrecy taking place? And I said, well, you got to realize that these, these guys are trying to figure it out. And I sent him a, a list of, uh, in the early 20th, 21st century, they were trying to figure out the Holloman Air Force Base film. And what it was, was all these guys asking questions. So there was Hal Putoff, uh, uh, Jacques Vallée, Eric Davis, uh, all these people. And they had this list of all these questions about uh, Holloman Air Force Base, uh, Paul Shardle. They were having an interview with Coleman and they all still work together. And that was the whole idea behind the Avery is because they can trust each other. They know they're talking behind the scenes. They're all trying to figure it out. So I think these guys, until they, they drop over dead, I think these guys will never stop the, the, the main players. Uh, but I think there are people coming from behind the scene. The only one I know for sure that's open is is Eric Davis and maybe Kripal. But uh, Diane Pasolka indicates there's a lot of people. Uh, Jim Semivan said, told Linda, Melinda Leslie, over 50 people. So there's a lot of people that are working in the background. And people don't understand why they want to do secrecy. And, and, and again, it has to do with your security clearance. Or the one said... If uh, could you ask, uh, I think Dolan told the story. Could you tell us who the 12 guys who are running it? Yeah, I could probably tell you, but then you go to the New York times, I'd have to deny it. And nobody would ever talk to me again. So they're all going to stay in the background. They're not going to talk. Or if you've got a patent, because, uh, if you know, Tyler D had the patent that made a lot of money on the one patent that he believed he got from, from the intelligence. And so patents are worth a lot of money. So the, if you're a scientist working on the very edge of this thing and, and the technology, are you going to give up what you've got and put it into the public before you file a patent? There's a lot of money. If, if you can crack any of these things, uh, these pieces of technology involved with UFOs, and you got to remember these people behind the scenes, it, it's going to all be about the money and getting patents and, as well as the classification. So a lot of these people, I think there's a lot of people behind the scenes, but we really don't know their names. Um, and when we look at the efforts that are happening right now in Washington, D.C., um, in, including this this intelligent budget uh, that got pushed through, the verbiage in this budget is deliberate, but somebody crafted it. Yeah. You know, that's not coming from a senator. That's That's coming from... Uh, somebody with knowledge of of what is going on, and this needs to be worded. I mean, this that budget sounds like an episode of Fade to Black. It's everything that we talk about inside of this yeah. community. Well, but, I, I, but, would, I would guess that it's that Elizondo because he's the one that, that stepped forward and said we got a problem. So sure. Elizondo would have a big influence on this, and Danny Sheehan. And that's why I said it was important that Danny Sheehan is playing the game because Danny Sheehan knows all the tricks. And he knows, uh, you know, stalling maneuvers and stuff like that. And if you remember how he said, he, they, they said, oh, we're going to look at procedures or whatever. He said, that's fine, but we want an investigation. And he's going to push to get it and and get it exactly the way he wanted it spelled out. So I think 
there's probably a lot of people I didn't put, but I would say Danny Sheehan and, and Elizondo and, and maybe Mellon. What is the problem? The problem Correct. is that we're not corresponding with people. We're not interacting with other agencies. And these are the problems that Elizondo saw. And he spelled them out to put it into law that this doesn't go on anymore. He realized why we're not we're not unraveling this problem. And it was because everybody's hiding the hiding the ball. And, and so I guess my point is not I guess my point is that the Alexanders and the, uh, the kick greens of the world from the old school, you know, from 1975. Yeah. 1980 have nothing to do with the efforts that are going on right now. This is being done by a whole nother generation of, of knowledge seekers. And that, I think that's my point. Yeah. But as I said, like the Elizondo, the original move with Elizondo at the New York times, Hal Putoff was involved in that. And, um, you have the, um, uh, yeah, Tyler D is definitely, uh, pushing there. As as to the 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 uh, legislation, I think that's going to be people that were in the game, like like uh, Mellon, who was in there and knows all the games that are played and what the problem was. And the problem, as as you're reading it uh, from that uh, that document, is the fact that we've got to get it all in one place, under control of of the the people who are responsible for it, so that we can figure this thing out and get it more into the white world where uh, it's it's done rather than a bunch of uh, rogue uh, contractors running off with the material and not talking to each other. It's uh, it's very interesting. And what do you what do you think ultimately is is going to transpire uh, in twenty twenty two? In that here we are again, Grant. You and I talked about this in two thousand fourteen. What, what do you think is going to happen in two thousand fifteen? <laughs> yeah. Right. What, what do you think is going to happen? Here we are. Uh, TTSA is done. It's gone. That didn't take uh, too long, three three or four years, and, and that came and went. And we thought that disclosure was December of 2017. And we're now pushing for going on five years now later. Um, what do you think is going to – here we go. What do you think is going to happen in 2022? Well, I, I would still maintain that, that one of the possibilities is that you did get disclosure on December 2017, because that was the briefing that was given to Trump. That was what you heard is Elizondo saying all uh, uh, Jim Semivan said, yes, UFOs exist. Yes, it's real. Yes, it's all it's all exactly. But we haven't got a clue what's going on. We don't know what it is. We and, and, it, and so I always say you can have a body because there's an admission that there's one body. There's at least one intact craft. But unless that body has a passport from Zeta Reticuli, how do you know where it came from? Because you can even take of the thing with 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 uh, Leslie Kane. That's why I say it's way more complex than people think it is. And when I, I got an interview with Leslie Kane, one thing I asked her was this thing in the physical physical seance thing. So if she's writing about you, you, uh, UFOs, everybody says, oh, yeah, she's fantastic. But she tells this story about the hand. You know the story about the hand mm -hmm. where she's in the physical seance and this hand appears and it comes from this sort of watery thing and it appears and she touches it and it's real and she can feel the knuckles. And then it it, it bangs on the table and goes back where it came came from. And that's what we're looking at, I think, is this idea that we, yeah, we're going to have more of the thing where, yeah, this is for real. Yeah, we're having all these sightings. But in terms of, of disclosure, we may have got disclosure that what Semi Van says, this has got to do with consciousness. This has got to do with interdimensionality. I don't think I'll ever see how this thing, how do you describe anything when there does not appear, appear to be any there there? And you got to remember, Semi Van was face to face with beings in his bedroom. He And he said his reality was shattered. And that's where I think the, the downfall is going to come is people think they're going to say, and, and you'll hear this thing, people say, I want disclosure. And what they mean by disclosure is I want you to tell me what I actually actually believe the reptilians are raping women or whatever your idea is. And the, the disclosure may simply be, yes, this is for real. And we haven't got a clue. This thing is way above us. We, we are, are the, what they call the core story. So help put off uh, Jacques Vallée and, and Kit Green got together in the Denny's restaurant. And I asked, uh, put off about this. Is this story true? He said, yes, the story is true. And the core story is Yes, we are being interacted by some sort of intelligence. Yes, we have hardware and we have not been able to back engineer it 
Eric Davis has said that that may be disclosure. Yes, we uh, UFOs are real. It's hard. It's it's got metal. It's got bodies, all this kind of stuff. But we really don't know for sure where it's actually coming from and what's going on. Even Elizondo at the one point that we there was a, an experiencer contacted me from Israel and he said, did you see what Elizondo said? I said, yeah, I saw what he said. We did a podcast on. So Elizondo was asked, is it on world or off world? He said, well, hang on. There's other possibilities. And he goes down the rabbit hole of this other thing. That's, I think, where they're going is it may not be as physical as people think it is. It's, it's, I say it's a thousand times more complex than people think it is. It's not going to be simply these are ETs that came in from Zeta Reticuli, got lost or whatever. It's going to be way more complex. And they're, I don't think they're going to release what they've got until they're sure. But I think they're a long way away. They know, yeah, they've got the hardware, they've got all this kind of stuff. But a piece of metal, you're not going to build a flying saucer from a piece of metal or whatever that they're, they're going to give the impression. Yeah, we're $5 billion. Give us $5 billion. We'll solve this thing. We're on the very edge, but you're going to do that for a cured cancer. we got the cured cancer. we got all figured out. We are at the very edge. I don't think they're at the very edge. I think it's like what Donald Trump was told. They showed me these videos. They said, these videos are real. I looked at them. They're very impressive, but I don't believe. And that may be what, because they told him, we don't really know what it is. And you hear this over and over again, this, this fact that we may know a lot less than what we think. We've got the hardware, bodies, all that kind of stuff. But in terms of them coming out and saying, yes, it's uh, extraterrestrial or it's interdimensional or whatever. The one thing I did and I had from and I tried to get if you ever get him on the show, I pushed him on it. And that was um, Brian Bender from Politico, who said that there was a, a study by the done by the Department of Defense on interdimensionality of these objects and that they had come to this idea that perhaps it's just it's from here. It's just a different here. And that was significant to me. And again, it indicated there's another program. And I don't know who's the contractor, but they had actually looked at that idea. The same as they'd looked at the injuries, the whole thing with the with Kit Green and Nolan working on experiencers, that there's these other programs we're not hearing about. The same as we're not hearing about the program of Skinwalker Ranch, because the Skinwalker Ranch is the, the higher element. UFOs is one thing, but when you get Skinwalker Ranch, you get the whole paranormal thing. How does telepathy work? How do you put stuff through metal? How do you how do you pop in and pop out? That's what Kit Green said. We're trying to figure out how do they pop in and pop out. It's this very complex uh, elements that are way more than just ETs are here or whatever it is that they're trying to figure out. And I don't think they're going to put their cards on the table because you mentioned they want to know what does Russia know? What does China know? Have they figured it out? Because if you, it's a game of, of cards. If you put your cards on the table and the Russians go, thank you, you gave me the card I want. We're no longer going to disclose. You give them the card they need. It's a game of cards. You're not going to put your cards on the table until you've got the technology in the bag. You can't because you don't know what your adversary has because they're all working on the same problem. And you may just give them the piece that they're looking for. Well, I, I, I think it's, it's actually more like a shell game in that the shells are being moved around and you're being told that we don't know you know what's underneath these shells but the person running that game knows exactly which shell is is got the secrets and and that's what i think is is more uh, uh closer to what we're dealing with because to say that we don't know but yet you have a crash retrieval flying saucer in 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 your possession that's et you know, or no, it's, uh, no. or what, 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 let me finish though. No. It's not us. It's not and, us. And, I agree and, with that. And, and so it, it, you can't say that you don't know nothing. Oh no, right? they know stuff, but they don't know a, the, the extent. They don't know exactly what it is. So you've got a craft. And as I, I've got 50 people. One of the things I do is the consciousness thing. I've got 50 people who have flown the craft. They all say exactly the same thing. You put your hand on a panel. You become one with the craft. The craft is alive. Whatever you think is what the craft does, this consciousness connection. So if you've got a craft that's intact, that's what's in the Wilson leak document. We have a craft we think it can fly. What does that mean? It means we've got a craft that we cannot turn on because you need a consciousness. It's like putting your fingerprint on your cell phone. You need the consciousness to turn it on. So just because you've got the craft doesn't mean you can make it propel. It do. Eric Davis talked about this. He talked to when he put down Lazar, he said, the guy's full of it. The stuff isn't even at area 51 and they shut the program down in 1989. Why would they shut the program down? And you hear this thing every seven or eight years to bring the program back up because it's so far beyond what we've got. So yeah, you've got pieces of metal. You've got all these crafts. You've got all this bodies and stuff like that. But in terms of figuring out exactly how does it all fit together, 
because uh, uh, you hear it over and over again. They're all saying the same thing. Eliz and I don't think they're lying. I don't think Elizondo's lying or, or Semivan when Semivan says, you know, how do you describe it when there's no there there? Or the, your, your interview, 2016 interview with Tom DeLong. Tom DeLong says he's talking to the head scientist at Lockheed. And he says to the head scientist, he said, Lockheed guy says, so tell me what's, what's, what's going on. How did it get here? And he said, oh, I think consciousness is involved because he was hanging out with Greer. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, I think consciousness is involved. And he said, this head scientist said, now you're talking. And all he wanted to talk about was for 45 minutes was consciousness. So, yeah, they know consciousness is involved. They know these, these connections. But in terms of figuring it all out, I don't think they I think they're way farther behind than, than what we think. And that's what Jack Vallee confirmed was this the, what's called the core story. We have the core bit that, yes, we're being interacted. But they, they repeat that we just do not know. Uh, how this thing, and that's why they're they're running these studies. How does it? That's what he said to 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 Burroughs, like Kit Green. We're trying to figure out how does it pop in and pop out just as quickly. And I maintain there's no way we have technology where you go inside the craft and it's the size of a football field inside the craft, or we've got technology where you're flying it with your mind. I just do not believe we have that technology. We know that that's possible because we know that's how it works. But it's one thing to to know how uh, the the principle. But to make it actually work and and get get this stuff, and that's why it's so highly classified, and that's why the Skinwalker Ranch report was not released, and that's because that's the real heavy duty stuff is the bizarre paranormal, the orbs, the portals, and stuff like that. And I believe the portal thing is real. I think we may have some portal technology, but in terms of uh, stuff, I I just don't think that it's all these guys because that's what I spent my life looking at was the highest level guys. What do the highest level guys know? And I, I always heard, you know, yeah, this stuff's for real, but I've never heard anybody who actually was in a position that said, yeah, we, we've, we've got this stuff. It's and, all rumors. And, 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 and to that point, you know, when we look at the Pandolfis of the world or the semi-vans or the Kid Greens or put-offs or Eric Davis, whatever, if you know their name, they don't know nothing. It, it, uh, it, would, right? <laughs> if you know their name... They don't know nothing. It's the the people that you don't know, those are the ones that have the knowledge and they're not in the public. They're not talking about yeah. it. Yeah, well, that's the Invisible College. That's where the, the story where Tom DeLong gets sent by the Lockheed guy to the pen, to the to the outside the in Pentagon City where the the meeting with Le, with Leslie Kane took place and he meets this guy sitting these two guys sitting behind the desk one's the Lockheed guy and the other guy's got a beard that looks like a spy and the guy says this stuff does not happen on the hill it does not happen uh, 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 at the White House it happens when people like this decide to take the football and move it down the field so it's this idea and that's how it's worked and that's saying what Alessandro and these guys are trying to shift it is away from these guys who have run with the ball and taking off in some black ops thing that you can't access because hell put off and all these guys would like that material, but they can't get to it. So they know that the black ops have, have got stuff that they could use. And what you're trying to do is get back control of it so that people who have a, a need to know can, can work it because right now it's not working. And Jack Ballet pointed us out. The reason it hasn't worked is because one piece is get, you got a piece, you got a piece. Nobody's talking to each other and nobody knows what anybody else is doing. And it's this stovepiping idea that it's all stalled down and they're trying to get it back in control where it's all under one thing. My big question is how much of it is going to be declassified? I think it's still going to be black ops. It's like, we, as I said, we can't even figure out how many pages are in the report. I mean, how much is going to be released? You're going to know, yeah, they're, they're, they're working on this stuff and they've, they're got these reports that's going classified but what what did we really learn that we didn't know a couple of years ago except that another level of sick people are working on the problem that yes it's for real and people but they're not really telling us how it works and i don't think we'll ever really be told because it's a eric walker i'll give you a we went after eric walker and kit green went after him because he realized how powerful this guy is here's what eric walker said why should we change the rules to satisfy your curiosity right you're just curious admit it and you think you're going to find the truth. You're never going to get the truth. So leave it alone. Forget it. And that's the idea. There are rules. And that was 1990. He said that there are rules. And we don't care if you're curiosity. And that's what Bush said to Carter. Curiosity is not sufficient need to know. Who cares if Jimmy Church and Grant Cameron want to know? We don't care. We're, we're working against the Russians. We're trying to get this. And that's that's security. You need a, you need a need to know. Curiosity is not a need to know. Don't, uh, and do you think that's such a great point? Do you think? Oh man, we're we're out of time. Okay, we got three minutes left, Grant. Try to okay. try to squeeze. I'm I plead with you, 
to get okay. your answer in. <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is this your rep your your reputation precedes you? You know this, right? Okay, so. <laughs> But but it's this. Do you think that the smoke and mirrors that is being run with this lack of knowledge publicly, we don't know what's going on. <clears throat> it's not it's not Russia, it's not China, it's not us. We have the other bin. Is that is that focus? Is that written for Russia? Is that written for China? Is that written for our adversaries? Uh, to say that, you know what, we don't know what's going on. Because if we say the opposite, then we let them know that that we know. Oh yeah. This, well, that's the part of the game. They're not going to t say anything. They're not going to give you anything. I think what you're going to get is some leaks of material that's coming out. But but again, you can't you can't release anything that you know for sure because you don't know what the other side's doing. So that that's where I'm saying mm -hmm. uh, anything they know for sure is going to be very highly compartmentalized. It was the Canadians said it was the most highly classified subject in the United States. Right. I believe it always will be the most highly classified subject in the United States because if you take a look at the technology, I mean it's beyond anything you could possibly imagine. And there's no way you're going to put it on the table and and take a chance that some other adversary is going to have the pieces and whoever gets this rules the world and it's all about ruling the world. But it, I, it, right. in the end, it's still not going to help you win the war against the Stone Age Taliban because you, you can have the biggest bombs and the fastest planes and the best intelligence. And in the end, now it seems like that's not how you win wars, but you will get this technology. And I think what they want to do is spin the technology out. And uh, it's all about, uh, you know, technology and money and patents. And that's the way it's been since World War II. Now, you know, if, if Tic Tacs rain down on Winnipeg like they rain down on the Nimitz, we've got a different situation here. Now we have the public watching this and witnessing this and not the military. And that okay. would present a different scenario. Okay. Well, but, but what I'd say to that is all the stuff that you're seeing, and I'll be talking about this, uh, Laughlin, I'll be giving an online lecture, but uh, uh, what I would say is when you get the, 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 the tic tac thing on the thing, you ask Bob Bigelow, Bob Bigelow ran ASOP. He ran ATIP. He was the contractor. And they asked him, Bob, what was Skinwalker Ranch all about? What was, you ran it for years. What was it about? He answered immediately. It's all about messaging. It's about gaming and messaging. All that stuff with the Nimitz is messaging. It's them sending a message. That's what it's, to me, it's all about messaging. Uh, what are you going to, I've got one minute left. Uh, what are you going to be uh, presenting at Laughlin? Uh, I've got two books. I'm going to get into some of the weird stuff because they want to do consciousness. I don't know if Jacques Vallée is supposed to be there, but I'm not sure where he's coming because he's the guy that started the whole thing about uh, understanding reality rather than going down the extraterrestrial road. So I'm going to do the, the, the 11 paranormal developments given to mankind to save the world. So I look at... Um, uh, the whole thing with spirituality, starting with the Fox sisters. I look at LSD. I look at the invention of the computer, uh, the invention of the Internet. And I show you all the paranormal things that people, how these things actually got developed, that the computer came in a download to some guy. And we think we figure these things out. And there's all this paranormal stuff. And the other thing I'm going to do is a uh, little bit of the thing, what I learned in th 46 years of UFO school. And a, and a lot of it goes to this consciousness thing, that the most important part is understanding reality. And that's what they did at Skinwalker Ranch. It wasn't figuring out UFOs. It's figuring out how does this paranormal, when you have anomalies, when you have paranormal anomalies, how do they work? If you can figure out how the anomaly works, you're going to learn something about how reality works, and that will give you all the technology you want. You've got to understand reality, not so much about the, the, the UFO thing. It's how does reality actually work? We're making a lot of mistakes about how if, if, the, if it worked the way we thought it worked, there would be no anomalies. UFOs, paranormal phenomena, all that stuff exists because we've got something wrong and that's what they're trying to do is figure out what have we got wrong what do we what do we miscalculate uh and how does it work and that's where you get the technology and you discover it and you rule the world i'll tell you what you learned in 47 years <laughs> not how to say the word um in two and a half hours you're incredible <laughs> thank you thank you jimmy grant you're the absolute very best be safe Happy up 15th there 1500th birthday yeah you know my birthday is sunday too so it's a, pr a pretty cool pretty cool week i'm 29 grant there you go Again, i'm, I'm a go. year older than you it's an honor to be on your show jimmy thanks you, you, thank you so much grant you are the absolute very best my friend and all of Grant's links and everything are over at jimmychurchradio.com. So uh, go follow. Check out the new books. And, uh, and I, I do want to thank, uh, I'm going to say this one more time, Nicole Sackett. Thank you so much. It's a great book. 
I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Another one down, show number 1500. Absolutely incredible, and I celebrated with Grant Cameron tonight. Thank you so much, Grant. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. This broadcast is only copyrighted 2021 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, show 1501. It's Fader Night with open lines all night long. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night, everybody be safe. It's time to fade to black. Grant, you stay right there. We'll do some after show. I'll see everybody tomorrow night.